everybody. I would like to call to order the regular meeting of the James City County Planning Commission. It is January 5th, 2022 at 6 p.m. Mr. Holt, will you call the roll, please? Ms. Null. Present. Ms. Null represents the Stonehouse District. Mr. Rose. Here. Mr. Rose represents the Roberts District. Ms. Leverens. Here. Ms. Leverens is an at-large member. In accordance with the Planning Commission's adopted policy, Ms. Leverens is also participating remotely from home this evening due to a medical condition that prevents physical attendance. Mr. Polster. Here. Mr. Polster represents the Jamestown District. Mr. Kropp. Here. Mr. Kropp represents the Powhatan District. Mr. O'Connor. Here. Mr. O'Connor is an at-large member and is this year's vice chair. I'm Paul Holt, Director of Community Development and Planning for the County, and sitting to my left is Mr. Max Halaven, our Deputy County Attorney. Mr. Chairman, we have a quorum. Thank you very much. Uh, to begin tonight's meeting, we just need to do a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, first on our agenda is the election of officers. So I would like to take a moment to uh, both congratulate and thank Mr. Polster and Mr. Kropf, who were reappointed for yet another, another term. So thank you for doing that. Um, per our bylaws, we'll need to elect a chair and a vice chair to serve until our organizational meeting in March. Uh, since we have a vacancy in the chair position. So, may I have a nomination for chair? Mr. Chairman, i like to nominate Tim O'Connor to be the chair. Second. Thank you. Any other nominations? <laughs> Any other willing? So, <laughs> um, so, so, we can do this by voice vote, so um, I'll, I'll be glad to do this till March. So, uh, all in favor of my serving as chair? Aye. 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 Any opposed? So thank you very much. Uh, next, I need a nomination for vice chair. Chairman, I'd like to nominate Frank Polster to be the vice chair. Mr. Polster, do you accept? I do. Thank you. Any other nominations for vice chair? Seeing and hearing none, I'll ask for a voice vote in favor of Mr. Pol Polster as vice chair. All in Aye. favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, next on our agenda this evening, we do have a resolution of appreciation for Ms. Leverance. Her term will be expiring at the end of the month, uh, but Ms. Leverance has graciously agreed to join us again in February so for an in-person presentation. So I think it would be more appropriate to, to thank her publicly in that manner. So uh, we don't need a motion or anything, just we're going to move that to our February agenda. This time on our agenda, it is our public comment period. This is for items that are not pertinent to any of our um, public hearings this evening. So if anybody wishes to speak about anything germane to the Planning Commission other than our public hearings tonight, you're welcome to. Your time is limited to three minutes. So seeing he and hearing none, we will move on to reports of the Commission. Ms. Null, DRC report. The meeting was called to order at 4 p.m. by Chairman Barbara Null. Members of the Planning Commission in attendance were Barbara Null, Frank Poster, Richard Kraft, and Rob Rose by phone. Staff present were Tom Weissong, Senior Planner, John Reisinger, Planner, Josh Crump, Principal Planner, and Katie Pelletier, Organizer. There was no old business to discuss. The first application was for a conceptual plan, 21-0097, Stonehouse Tract S. The plan is for 300 residential units on 173 acres, currently zoned as a PUD-R with proffers. As discussed, the plan complies with the approved master plan for Stonehouse. It aligns with the land use designations, units permitted, and density for Tract S. The DRC voted to pass this application to the full PC by a vote of four to zero. The second application was for conceptual plan 210098, Stonehouse Tract 11A. The plan calls for 320 residential units on 131 acres, currently zoned PUDR with proffers. Again, as discussed, this plan complies with the master plan for Stonehouse. It aligns with the land use designations, the number of units permitted, and permitted density for Tract 11A. The DRC approved to send this application on to the full planning commission by a four to zero vote. Meeting was adjourned at 4.30. Thank you very much. Any questions of Ms. Null? 
Mr. Bolster, anything from Policy Committee? Nothing to report, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So our next item is the consent agenda. This portion of the agenda is reserved for items that are generally non-controversial in nature. If any member wishes to pull an item for discussion or a separate vote, please advise at this time. Otherwise, it may have a motion to approve the minutes of the December 1st, 2021 regular meeting, the Development Review Committee Action, item C21-0097, Stonehouse Tract X, S, and Development Review Committee Action, item C21-0098, Stonehouse Tract 11A. Move to approve. We have a motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Our first public hearing this evening is zoning case-19-006 and special use permit-19-0005 Hazelwood Farms, the Enterprise Center. Good evening, Mr. Weissong. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening to the commission. Mr. Tim Trant of Kaufman and Knowles has applied on behalf of the Hazelwood Farm property owners to rezone approximately 328 acres from its current zoning of B1 General Business and A1 General Agricultural to the EO Economic Opportunity Zoning District to allow for up to 3,220,000 square feet of warehouse, industrial, and office use. Going along with this rezoning is a request for a special use permit to allow for the following uses, fast food restaurants, the manufacture and processing of textiles and textile products in structures more than 10,000 square feet, Heavy equipment sales and service with major repair under cover or screened with landscaping and fencing from the adjacent property. Machinery sales and service with major repair under cover. A convenience store. Any commercial building or group of buildings that exceeds 10,000 square feet of floor area. Any commercial building or group of buildings, not including office uses, which generates or would be expected to generate a total of 100 more additional trips to and from the site during the peak hour of operations as well as any additions and expansions requiring an SUP in that use. And the extension of public water and sewer facilities up Route 30 and along Route 746 to serve this property. Since the October 6th Planning Commission meeting, the applicant has made several changes to this application. Specifically, the applicant has removed the apartments and multifamily component from the SUP application, meaning there is no longer a residential component for this project. The applicant has also removed the truck terminal component from the SUP application. The applicant has also increased the amount of warehouse industrial and office use from 2,920,000 to 3,220,000 with this increase being located in the former proposed location of the residential uses. This site is located inside the primary service area and is designated for economic opportunity, Barmsville interchange area in the adopted comprehensive plan. The recommended primary uses for this area include industrial, light industrial, office, medical research, and or tourist attraction uses, with secondary uses such as retail, commercial, being limited in amount and type to support the primary uses. Staff finds multiple favorable factors for this application. The proposed uses for this site aligns with the comprehensive plan. The applicant is proposing proffers to mitigate the impacts that are associated with this rezoning, which includes transportation improvements to the surrounding road network, design guidelines for the development of the site, use limitation for certain commercial uses, and the submittal of a water and sewer master plan prior to development. Furthermore, the county is proposing conditions to mitigate impacts associated with the special uses. These conditions include en enhanced landscape buffering along the Barnes Road, Route 30, Leisure Road, Route 746, and Interstate 64 right-of-ways, enhanced site design and architectural design, and specific restrictions regarding location and site features for certain specially permitted commercial uses. Overall, staff finds that proposed rezoning and special use permit will not negatively impact surrounding development and that the proffers and proposed conditions will help mitigate impacts that are generated by this proposal. Staff also finds that the development of the property is consistent with the recommended land use and the comprehensive plan. Accordingly, staff recommends that the Planning Commission recommend approval of this application to the Board of Supervisors subject to the proposed proffers and SUP conditions. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have for staff and the applicant team is here with us tonight as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions for Mr. Weissong? Ms. Leverins, any questions for Mr. Weissong?
that is a no. So I'm sure you'll be back. Thank you very much. Thank you. And prior to open, uh, opening the public hearing, um, because I will forget when it comes time to our talk, I'll ask if there are any disclosures. Mr. Krupp. Mr. Chairman, I have a couple of disclosures. Um, one is I met with the applicant after our October 6th Planning Commission meeting. I talked to Mr. Trant on the telephone this morning, and uh, I am on the board of an organization that is going to speak here tonight uh, on this application. But regardless, uh, I feel that I can uh, participate in the discussions uh, fairly and uh, un in an unbiased manner and in the best interest of the county. So while not obligated, it's not a conflict of interest, I do want to be transparent and make you all aware of that. Mr. Polster. Uh, I attended the uh, 15 December Hazelwood community meeting out at the Croker uh, station. I've had several conversations with Mr. Dexter Williams on the traffic piece. And of course, I've talked with Mr. Marson about the project also. No? I attended the town hall meeting on the 21st of December, and afterwards I had a, a chat with Mr. Trant. Dr. Rose? Ms. Leverance? Hearing none, and I did have a discussion with Mr. Trant, but that was in the first application and haven't had any subsequent um, conversations since then. So at this point, I will open up the public hearing for Hazelwood Farms Enterprise Center. So does the applicant wish to make a presentation? Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. My name is Tim Trant attorney with the law firm of Kaufman and Canoles offices at 4801 Courthouse Street here in James City County. It's my privilege to be here tonight on behalf of the applicant, the Hazelwood family. I'll introduce to you briefly the uh, project team members that are here. If I can figure out how to advance the slides. Technology challenge, there we go. Okay. Is there a way for me to do that? I'm sorry. Yes, clicking and scrolling. Now I'm going myself. <laughs> yes, ma'am, I will do it. Sorry, Beth. Um, in any event, I'll int briefly introduce the, uh, the applicant and the applicant uh, team. Um, first and foremost is the... Um, the Hazelwood siblings, Larry, Debbie, and RM, who RM Hazelwood, who couldn't be with us tonight. Um, representatives of the uh, consulting team, Art Marston and Jason Grimes, both professional engineers with AES Consulting Engineers, the civil design team for the project. Uh, John Hopke with Hopke and Associates has done the architectural um, uh, piece of the application and, and most notably the uh, design guidelines and then Dexter Williams certainly last but not least our traffic consultant uh, professional engineer that's handled all the, the traffic analysis for the project um, this is just an aerial photograph I'm sure you all know where the project is but I included it just in case we need to come back here for reference um, one of the things that I have found um, important to explain as we have gone through this process is to, you know, we talk, uh, and this is as much or more so for the audience as it is for uh, the commission, but we talk a lot about the, the application, the zoning, but we very seldom sort of stop and talk about, okay, what are we going from? You know, where are we at today? We talk a lot about where we're trying to go, but I think it's a helpful reference point to understand what the current status of the property is from a zoning perspective. As you can see, this is the snapshot of the county zoning map. Um, the property is, is sort of highlighted there in green and uh, in, in pink, light pink. Um, the piece in, in pink, which is about two thirds of the acreage is zoned B1. So the property is currently zoned B1. Um, the area in green is, um, is zoned A1, and that's the, about a third of the property adjacent Barnes Road. Uh, so under the B1 zoning ordinance, there's a, 
a considerable amount of what we call by right development opportunity, uh, the, the ability to develop the property that does not require a change in, uh, in zoning or some sort of special land use approval. Um, the, as you probably saw from the previous slide, there are th three parcels that sort of make up the B1 zoning area. Two small uh, residential sort of, you know, in character currently in their current use, uh, parcels in the sort of northeast corner adjacent uh, uh, Old Stage Road and Route 30 and then the larger acreage beyond. You know, to, if you were going to pursue a by right development of the project, what you would do is do a boundary line adjustment, which doesn't require any special legislative approval, that would reconfigure those three parcels. It would make those two uh, small parcels at the corner much larger and, and suitable for presumably some retail development at the at that interchange at that intersection of stage road and route 30 presumably you know convenience store gas station fast food would be likely users of those two out parcels uh, and then the, the residual parcel you would probably do uh, a minor subdivision to to uh, you know, preserve the maximum uh, flexibility in terms of regulatory requirements uh, for that subdivision. And then, you know, the uses that, that might be, uh, you know, put into place out there are numerous. B1 is one of the county's more permissive zoning districts. It, it permits basically all things retail. Now, the county does have some very protective measures, which, which are actually um, pr pretty good uh, and, and unique, really, among um, local zoning, municipal zoning ordinances. They have sort of a, a a safety valve to, to bring in for legislative review uses that um, have you know particular uh, impacts that the county is concerned about and the there are uses specifically listed as specially permitted uses but then there are some that are permitted by right in you know in, in on its face or on the face of the zoning ordinance but because of their impacts they may trigger special use permit review, and I want to be clear about that. Those are uses like convenience stores with gas stations. They have unique impacts, traffic generation, environmental concerns. Those come in for SUP even if they were permitted by right in the zoning ordinance uh, on its face. Um, also, um, fast food restaurants, if they hit a trip generation, typically in excess of uh, 100 vehicle trips in the peak hour or 1,000 over the course of a 24-hour period. That brings you in for a commercial, what we call commercial SUP scrutiny. So things that may be by right, restaurants are permitted and fast food restaurants by right, but a lot of times the trip generation associated with a particular uh, fast food restaurant will bring them in for special use permit review. In buildings, uh, commercial buildings over 10,000 square feet, retail type buildings. In any event, um, so those would come in for potentially for review if any of those uses were, were to go on the property uh, under a legislative uh, program. They, they would likely come in as, as one-offs um, without any ability to sort of direct or control what happens on the residual pieces. You'd have one user come in and want to plop down on one parcel, and then sometime later you'd have another come down and want come in and want to plop down on the other parcel. You know, for the basic um, other by-right uses, which uh, would not typically fall under the, that commercial SUP uh, trigger is warehousing, for one. Warehousing is permitted by right in the B1 zone. And uh, most of, of what we are proposing in, in the way of the, the project involves some element of warehousing. It's a, it's a key part of most industrial and, uh, and manufacturing uses. Warehousing is permitted by right in B1. It is not subject to the commercial SUP uh, square footage limitation. So you could have a very large warehousing facility with direct access onto Leisure Road and, and uh, Old Stage Road. Uh, which we do not see as, as desirable as it relates to the access onto Leisure Road. Um, other uses that are permitted by right in B1 that uh, would be candidates for the site that are not um, it, uh, uh, likely to trigger a special use permit or other legislative review, it's a kennel, a building supply company, boat storage, boat repair, automobile repair, automobile and trailer sales used in new um, sales are all uses that typically would not trigger the trip generation uh, uh, rates that would throw it into an SUP review or um, the 10,000 square feet uh, element of, of a buy right use. And so this is sort of, and then the, the residual piece uh, that, that is zoned A1 
uh, in fronts on Barnes Road, you know, has a much more limited development potential, certainly residential. Um, by right, you know, right now, three acre lots, um, you have to address water through a community water system, but um, that's the potential. And then access, of course, for that onto Barnes Road, you could do a, a fairly um, a modest uh, subdivision plan of get you, you know, through minor subdivisions of nine lots out there. But that's sort of the, the current development potential. That's what will happen on the property if we don't go through with uh, a change in zoning and, uh, and imposing a master plan as we've proposed. That's the, the base uh, opportunity for development of the property, uh, which it will, will be inevitable um, with this, this property. Um, one of the things, and I'll let Larry come up and talk a little bit about his family's, you know, perspective on this and, and why they're here, but um, the three siblings grew up on the property. Um, they have owned it in, in, with their father and mother's passing for quite some time. They've carried it through, tax, you know, to, to, to their financial loss. Uh, you know, the carry cost of the taxes and insurance and, and maintenance are not uh, uh, compensated fully by the farm rent that they get from the property. Um, and there's an emotional attachment there. They do not, they are not excited. Uh, they understand that development of that property is inevitable and, uh, in, in, you know, in, on the horizon in the, in the near term, um, just by the evolution of their family and their, their inability to continue to, to uh, hold it in perpetuity uh, as it currently exists. And they do not want to see it happen in a, in a disorderly way. Um, they would like to have some control while they still are with us and have the wherewithal to, to sort of impose that type of uh, development control. And their objectives as we have gone through the development approval process have been to come up with an orderly development plan, a, an actual um, plan for how the property will develop over time. One that complies with the county's expectation for the development of the property. Their strict instructions to us from the beginning is that we want to have this be something consistent with the county's future land use intentions for this property. We do not want to sort of go against the grain. We understand we obviously can't make everybody happy and there will be those that, that uh, object to the, the proposed development plan. But in terms of the county's policies, published policies, the adopted policies of the county, they wanted very much to, to be consistent with those. Um, to impose a comprehensive master plan for the development of the property, to impose design guidelines it was a big piece of what they wanted to accomplish, an aesthetic control on how the property would look like, a uniform vision for how it would develop with buffers and architectural treatments and landscaping and access points, um, orientation of buildings to the road and, and uh, adjacent properties. They wanted to impose a traffic mitigation plan that would address the traffic concerns. Sort of unique to this project and, and different than any other I've worked on in my 20 years of doing this, the we started with traffic impacts in backed into the development plan. Most often and always in every other case that I've been involved with, the developer has an idea or the landowner has an idea of what they want to do on the property and the traffic impacts are what they are and you just try to mitigate them as best you can. In this case, we started with Dexter. We had him run a number of iterations for, for development on the property to test what the traffic impacts would be and with the the direction that we wanted him to dictate to us what the development potential of the property should be as it relates to traffic. So in other words, what is a reasonable traffic mitigation plan? What type of improvements are readily achievable in this corridor to mitigate the impacts of the development we'll have? We don't want to you know, create traffic problems that we can't solve. Um, or come up with, you know, particularly uh, creative traffic solutions that, that are, you know, not time tested. How, how, do, how do we do that and then tell us what the, limit of, the limits of development should be to stay within, under that, that threshold? And that's exactly what we did. Dexter ran a number of scenarios programming in progressively more development until he got to a point that, hey, guys, I think you need to stay under this number of trips in terms of traffic generation. And we've actually gone uh, so far as to proffer that as a cap on the project, which is 944 vehicle trips in the peak hour, is what he said was sort of the threshold for, for reasonable traffic mitigation and to maintain the overall level of service C in the corridor. Um, the, and last but not least was to attract desirable business uh, businesses to the county, both centers of employment, uh, tax revenue, those range from research and development, 
corporate campuses, fulfillment centers, and manufacturing. Um, and I think at this point, maybe I will stop and, and let Larry and, um, just say a, a few words about the family situation and what's brought them to bringing the application forward, and then I'll walk you through the changes that we've made and answer any questions that you have. Chairman, members of the commission, I'm Larry Hazelwood, 2420 Ocean Shore Crescent. I live in Virginia Beach now. <clears throat> I appreciate the opportunity to address you. Uh, I, I'm here simply to tell you that we are longtime James City County family. My, I'm representing my brother Robert and my sister Debbie. Uh, all three of us went to Matthew Whaley. All three of us went to James Blair High School. Uh, we're kind of dating ourselves now by I don't think James Blair is a high school much anymore. Um, but our, our roots are in James City County. Our great-grandfather actually secured and acquired this land back in 1886. And on that land, our grandfather was born in 1895, and he lived his entire life on that farm. And my father was born there in 1925, and he lived his entire life on that farm. And of course, after the war, things changed, demographics changed. There's no longer the family farm unit. The farm's not actually big enough to support multiple families. Um, so we all sought our life courses in other directions. We live in other localities nearby. We no longer live in James City County. We maintain an office in James City County, and we do business in James City County. So our roots here are deep. Um, <clears throat> we're very concerned about, it uh, wasn't too long ago, I came down Old Stage Road to uh, get onto Route 30. Holy cow, what a nightmare that is. And I know that's a lot of concern for folks, if some that are going to speak here tonight. It's a concern for me, actually. <clears throat> we have a uh, traffic engineer who's done a wonderful job of sorting this out and Trust me, you almost have to be a traffic engineer to understand how it works, I think, because I've had to read it probably 300 times at least. So my point is, I want to make the point that I'm concerned, my brother and sister are concerned, traffic is an issue. And I think uh, Dexter, our traffic engineer, has come up with a solution that's going to be pretty well, and basically it's rebuilding Old Stage Road. It's on, not on the current alignment, it'll be a new alignment. There's six lanes at Route 30. So I want to stress to you that we, as the Hazelwood family, are striving and pushing to make this a good development, not only for the Hazelwood family and our legacy, but for the citizens of James City County and for James City County. We're not gonna, we're not gonna have a residential component anymore. We listened to the citizens and we immediately pulled that out. So to benefit all concerned, we think we've struck a pretty decent compromise. And yes, it's unsettling to know that, but I gotta tell you, we wanted to do this during our lifetime, my brother and sister and I, because there's a, there's a fifth and sixth generation coming up. And the truth is, we want this locked down into a logical, sensible order of development. Uh, because once you get past our generation, there becomes multiple generations of kids that are scattered who they probably don't even know where James City County is, quite honestly. So we want to make sure it's done the right way, and that's our sole purpose. And I don't think there will be a lot of dirt turned the next week or next year or, or anytime soon. It's important to us to lay this groundwork now, today, to make sure this thing is done in the correct manner. I thank you for your time. So I'll defer to you all because clearly we've hit 15 minutes for the presentation. So understanding there were changes, um, do you all want to ask questions or allow Mr. Trant to continue? I want to see what he's got. Yeah, I'd like him to continue as okay. well. So I'd like to post. continue, yes. Okay. Thank you for that latitude. I'll be as expedient as I, I can. Thank you. Hi, please. So um, the guidepost uh, for what uh, we proposed was the, the comprehensive plan. 
just a little bit of history. The comprehensive plan uh, was adopted to uh, in, in, uh, designate this property as, uh, as economic opportunity and to include it all within the primary service area on June 23rd, 2015. Um, the comp plan, as you know, was recently reviewed and updated and unanimously approved, uh, not only by the Planning Commission, but the Board of Supervisors, which included this, this very same recommendation that this property be designated as a future land use for economic opportunity. And, and we have, as best we are uh, professionally able, put forward a plan that we believe complies 100% and, and identically with the comprehensive plan and its recommendations. Um, the changes, uh, just quickly, have already been touched on by Mr. Wysong, but I'll uh, reiterate them. You know, we did hear loud and clear at the last Planning Commission meeting, both from uh, the citizens but all, that spoke, but also from commissioners, that the residential uh, land use component was a point of concern, and we removed it. The Hazelwoods were swift and, and really decisive that that was not critical to them. They were setting out to create a business park. And, and the residential was not an essential part of the project. We um, backfilled that residential land bay, as I'll explain, with about 300 square, 300,000 square feet of uh, business uses, uh, similar to the other land bays that would not uh, generate, uh, would, would generate less traffic than the, uh, than the residential use. So we expect overall for it to be a lesser traffic impact. Uh, we also eliminated the truck terminal as a proposed specially permitted use. So I can take that off. Um, so those are the two changes. This is the updated conceptual plan. Uh, as you can see, uh, it still includes in the northeast corner the sort of uh, commercial hub, which is to serve uh, the, the business park for uh, office uh, and, and retail services. We expect restaurants, maybe a gas station with a convenience store, bank, you know, retail offices of that sor sort to populate that area, also serving, you know, the adjacent uh, uh, commuting traffic and, and interstate traffic. Uh, the remaining land bays uh, of the, the total of six, the remaining five are all designated for uh, economic development business type uses, uh, the light industrial, warehousing, manufacturing, and office uses. Moving on, um, we did hold uh, three community meetings, and that was uh, largely at the urgence of the, uh, the Planning Commission and the county staff. Uh, we hosted those all in December. Um, they were reasonably well attended. Um, we split, split them up into three different meetings and limited the total number of attendants in, in an effort to be uh, responsible in, in the midst of a pandemic. Um, and, and we had good attendance and good turnout and good feedback from, from those meetings. Um, and our changes you know, to the residential section and, and, the, um, and removal of that and the uh, fuel terminal or the, um, excuse me, the truck terminal were all sort of responsive to some of that, that uh, consistent with the feedback that we received at those community meetings. Um, just some of the project benefits, uh, humbly submit that uh, we, this ensures an orderly and attractive development of the property and uh, mitigation of the associated traffic impacts through uh, a, a series of traffic improvements. It is 100% consistent with the county's very recently adopted comprehensive plan, a plan that applicants you know, like the Hazelwoods rely on when they're putting forward applications that, that applicants, you know, when they, they rely on when they invest money in these processes um, on what the county has established and particularly you know, a newly minted affirmation of, of the vision for this property. Um, the Hazelwood family is proposing a business park in, in substance, uh, which most localities, to include James City County, have to fund with taxpayer dollars. You know, the county has invested in various business and industrial parks in the county, as do most other localities, and uh, this one is, is one proposed by, um, by a private enterprise. Uh, uh, savings to the county and its, um, its uh, you know, initiation and uh, with the same uh, resulting economic benefits. It is true economic development. A lot of projects uh, that we bring forward in for new development in the county are mixed use in nature. They have some economic uh, contributions through business uses, retail and, and office and um, uh, those types of uses, but there's also typically a countervailing uh, fiscal negative like residential development. This is all fiscally positive 
uh, development and, and is heavily concentrated to, to true economic development. Even commercial development, which is fiscally positive, will sometimes receive criticism uh, for the low wage jobs that, that are typically associated with retail um, businesses. But this, this includes an, a vision for office manufacturing and light industrial uh, employment. It's an ideal location. It's where you want development. If you're looking to propose, it's why the board ultimately adopted it as an economic opportunity zone. Uh, it's adjacent to the interstate. It's, well, a lot of good traffic um, infrastructure in the vicinity, and it's in close proximity to the port, um, better than having it spread elsewhere in the county and, and uh, creating f um, undue traffic impacts. Uh, Virginia Economic De Development Partnership Tiering um, the VEDP, as we call it, is really the state's economic development office, and it's the gatekeeper for a lot of the large uh, economic uh, development prospects that, that uh, seek uh, land use or land opportunities throughout the county. And by putting this master plan in place, it will raise the, uh, the, the prospect of, of attracting one of those users to this project. Um, just briefly, the design guidelines. These are pictures from the design guidelines. This is... Uh, the words are equally or of greater importance in the design guidelines, which I'm sure you have reviewed, but just a visual representation of the quality of development that we believe repre is reflective uh, of the county's retail component. These are light industrial examples of, of the quality of development that is proposed and is sort of set as a standard for the project. These are just more examples. The Stonehouse Commerce Park is not a, an un, uh, 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 not a totally dissimilar project to, to what is being proposed in terms of the entrance boulevard, the landscaping, the buffering, and the quality of development there. These are just other examples of, of existing business. This would be an office building and a warehousing building that would fit within the, the development scheme and design guidelines that we've proposed. As you can see in this picture, a large uh, entrance boulevard with the, um, the property or the development fronting on that uh, industrial boulevard, not on a main uh, collector road. Um, talk briefly about the traffic improvements that are proposed. As you can see in this slide, uh, there are two main entrances. We have proposed to restrict traffic to two access points directly onto um, Old Stage Road, and uh, no access to Leisure Road, in fact, a 100 foot buffer along Leisure Road and to essentially rebuild Old Stage Road from its intersection at Route 30 down to the entrance of Leisure Road and to concentrate all of our traffic on to these two roads. There's another slide that details those are some of the major infrastructure improvements with the traffic signal. There are a number of other uh, more modest uh, improvements, some of which are, are arguably uh, worthy of making today, but additional through lanes, um, improving turn lanes, and, uh, and, and turning radiuses in that in that or radii in that um, vicinity. Um, I think last but uh, certainly not least, one of the, the comments that we heard at the last Planning Commission meeting was a concern over the specially permitted uses and, and that being um, they're being new and, and uh, uh, uncertain in a way that, that troubled certain commissioners and, and certainly respect that. I um, would submit to you uh, in, in my you know, experience that that is, in practice, I don't believe the case. Um, a lot of specially permitted uses um, come in as what I call one-offs. You have, you have one on the agenda tonight um, where you've got a, a defined user, a known occupant, a known tenant. It comes in, you get elevations that show exactly what that use is going to look like on that one parcel. But you don't get any vision or control over what happens adjacent to that parcel on the next parcel. No consistent um, architectural commitment across a broader range of, of properties. And, and that is, is typically okay when, you, when you've got a, a single user and a single parcel. But when you're proposing uh, a, a master development plan, like in some instances a, a shopping center is probably the closest thing the county's approved in a long time that's akin to this, you don't have certainty of that end user. Um, all you have are the design guidelines, um, the master plan, and the conditions and proffers that go along with the project. Um, you, you don't know, you know, I remember when Lightfoot uh, uh, 
or excuse me, not Lightfoot Marketplace, but uh, Windsor Mead Marketplace was approved. Um, we knew who the anchor tenant was likely to be. We had a, a, a commitment from Belt to occupy that site, and I so badly wanted to be able to say at the public hearing, you know, this will be a Belk anchored shopping center because I thought that that would, I assumed that that would be attractive and and help advance the uh, the approval of the application. And the, the developer was a uh, very old school developer in this area, said, hey, look, you know, we don't, until they occupy that store, we don't know who it's going to be. And, uh, and we cannot uh, be out representing it's going to be Belk and, then, and be accused of a bait and switch. We want to do business in this county long term. And, you know, so we, what we are selling and, and what we are presenting to the county is a master plan and a set of design guidelines and a land use not the actual tenants. And so I would respectfully submit to you that the controls that are on this development are identical to, in many cases, and, and I would respectfully submit in excess of um, the types of controls that the county gets for its standard SUP approvals. Um, no, it is true we don't have identified end users uh, for some of these specially permitted uses, but the controls on what they'll look like, how they can be oriented to the road, um, are all in there and, and uh, identical to the conditions in other special in, in recently approved special use permits like Lightfoot Marketplace, for example, very, almost identical conditions to uh, controlling how that development will, will happen. Um, in addition to that, we have proposed limitations on the number of uses that can go, some of these specially permitted uses. You know, it can only be, you know, one convenience store and, and uh, one fast food restaurant and one bank and the, those types of things. We have limited the number of uses that can be, be uh, accommodated of those specially permitted uses that can be accommodated. For the industrial uses um, that uh, we have proposed specially, uh, be specially permitted, the textile manufacturing facility, heavy equipment sales and service, uh, machinery sales and service, those are the, really the only three um, at this point. Those are all uses that, um, th that I think are, are, are fairly innocuous in character. I think the sensitivity to having them as specially permitted uses somewhat may be, uh, you know, a somewhat antiquated understanding of, of textile mills, for example. They don't, they're not, they're much, it's a much cleaner industry uh, in 2022 than it, than it was maybe when that was adopted. Additionally, um, they all front on, a, an, on an internal industrial boulevard. The big concern for those uses is if those EO zones fronted on uh, a primary collector road, like Route 30, for example, you might have much more concern about how those uses happen on the site and how they're oriented to the road and what they can display and what they can't. This, these uses are all oriented on an internal collector road that will be largely invisible from adjacent properties in the interstate and roadway networks. So um, the, the short of all that rambling is that I would – humbly submit to you that the specially permitted uses are not only essential to the you know, the, the success of the application and, and the development, but they are, uh, the county has a, a, a protection in the conditions and proffers that are proposed in the design guidelines and master plan that is equal to or greater than what you're accustomed to getting, you know, with the uh, final and additional commitment to the overall trip generation limit on the project. And with that, I apologize for, for running over, conclude my remarks, and offer to answer any questions that you may have. Can I ask you, uh, Mr. Trant, um, I understand that this area is in a foreign trade zone. Can you explain that to me? I would probably not be the best steward of, oh, okay. of that answer, Somebody but Mr. Hazelwood. I didn't hear the question. Foreign trade zone? Oh, yes. Foreign trade zone is governed by the um, U.S. Customs and Border Patrol. And basically that allows a business or an enterprise to say locate on this property, import materials through Newport News Port Authority, through the Virginia Port Authority, which would include Richmond, Newport News, Norfolk, Portsmouth. Uh, he can bring those materials in on a tariff-free basis. Um, and there are some controls that the, um, the U.S. Customs put in there, and it's, it's basically a bonded-type situation that all these materials have to be accounted for. Basically, he's going to manipulate these, these, um, these materials. I, I did one previously that was uh, the guy made frames for diplomas and certificates. He imported raw lumber and sawed it and 
milled it, and made frames. And as the result was he paid no import tariff and there was no tax on it leaving his shipping door. And what happens is, and there's a lot of real estate available in the foreign trade zone, but let me tell you, it stops at New Kent County land. So James City County is very fortunate to have this available to them because the key to import export is transportation, easy on, easy off, Interstate 64, that's really the key to it. Um, it does attract a global audience is what I'm trying to say. Many, uh, many offshore companies look at that. Right. I, think that's ex I think that's great. Yeah. That, that's really a plus for people coming to this area, to, to bring things in duty-free, <clears throat> be able to produce them here and turn around and, and sell them. That's a huge... And having some uh, extensive overseas work myself, a lot of the foreign companies, uh, Europeans, uh, the Netherlands, places like that, they love these campus-style facilities. And if you'll notice the, the drawing that Tim had up there before, I can't make this, I'm afraid to put it in there, but those land bays are not rectangular or square in shape. They're, they're irregular because they, they flow with the ravine or the, the uh, wetland area or the RPA. So they're irregular. Well, unlike um, other uh, industrial parks you've been in where they might have a, a wonderful entrance and, and then there's this boulevard and it's just building after building straight line. This will be more of a curving type nature where you might you might not see a building until you come around the, the corner. And it's all buffered and hidden by vegetation. And it, 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 My vision is it's going to be very green looking. So, so yes, ma'am, thank, thank you for you. your question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bolster. Could we come back to the lane piece that you showed, that diagram? And, and so I've got like three questions or three areas that I want to try to get. The first one uh, is that um, one, one uh, the more. buff. Go back, Beth. I'm sorry, the other direction. Is that the one? Yeah, I'll, I'll start off with that one. But, but the first question I have has to do with I want to try to understand the conditions of the buffering and the statement in the design guide lines for view sheds. I think that's Mr. Hopkins uh, for it. Uh, on the leisure road, uh, road itself, most of that area is wooded right now, and it really is a buffer to all those properties on the other side. So, and there's a 100-foot buffer on that side. But when you put a building in there, what are the provisos to make sure that that wood line and that buffering are going to be there from the design guideline piece? Well, the <coughs> oh, John Hopke, uh, the uh, design guidelines uh, talk about uh, uh, the view shed and the approach to the property uh, is a combination of uh, architectural elements and the putting the developer will be required to put the best face forward to the uh, to people as they approach the property by foot or by car but also landscaping and there are uh, considerable buffers around the property along leisure road um, Could I jump in? yes right please the, uh, the um, so the SUP condition number eight requires for there to be a 100-foot vegetated landscape buffer along Leisure Road, so they wouldn't be permitted to build within that 100 feet. I understand that, okay. but if you take a look at the design guideline paragraph, when it talks about the 50-foot buffer on Old Stage Road and then the 30-foot, it talks about a view shed so that the buildings that are inside that commercial area, if viewed, there'll be a design modification to the building if the buffering piece doesn't hide it. That's clear to me that you have to, the design guidelines will make sure that the view from old, uh, from uh, Barnesville Road, you won't see what's going on. But it doesn't indicate anything on the 100-foot buffer for any building that's behind there. Behind the 100-foot buffer. buffer. So if you chop down the trees, those people are going to see all that. 
even though you got 100. So what's the vegetation and the ability to make sure that the building blends into the environment, which is what your design guidelines say? The buffer, the 100 foot buffer, correct me if I'm wrong, is undisturbed. So in the site plan approval process, any existing vegetation within that 100 foot area would have to be preserved. And where it doesn't exist, it would have to be supplemented to meet the county's landscape standards for that buffer. Okay, so it's undisturbed, undisturbed. so that view shed is going to remain there, mature trees, da 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 Okay, I got that one. The second one is on the traffic piece, and it's probably for uh, Mr. Williams. And the reason I asked about the buffering is we got a lot of questions and comments about people and what the impact was going to be. And the second area that we heard a lot of things are with the traffic. And, and so you and I have gone back and forth on this for a while to make sure that I understood what the implications are of the 944. And, and so if I understand it correctly, is the whole idea of these mitigations and conditions that you have for the traffic is to make sure that the flow of traffic on Barnesville Road remains at a level C, which is what the Board of Supervisors requirement is and you've done that by to clarify I, I think you meant uh, Barronsville Road right the Barronsville Road I'm sorry Route 30 Route 30 that's an easier way because it's actually part old stage road right also. exactly so the, the Route 30 but the number of turn lanes for example if I was going through Barnesville and I wanted to make that left hand turn on old stage road how many lanes of traffic uh, are you going to be accommodating on that going north uh, we'll have, a, there's a single left turn lane there today, and, and this development will be adding a second left turn lane in addition to the signal. It's all part and parcel of the sig signalization. And the, uh, isn't there a lane that's going to go into the, into the uh, on-ramp for the 64 also that will be continuous through there? Uh, yes, sir. On, on uh, uh, viewing Route 30 is northbound, southbound. Uh, going northbound from Route 60 towards uh, Old Stage Road intersection, uh, we'll be adding a third lane of pavement on the right side of the road to create three through lanes at Old Stage Road. That third lane will then drop off at the ramp to go east on 64. And then the other thing is if I'm going coming off of uh, 64 from Richmond uh, and I'm headed towards Tohanna, you got a blue area there. Is that a continuation of that lane coming in so that there's, if you were going to go into the uh, Barnesville approach, you don't have to jockey over and then come back in? Is that yes, correct? sir. That, that's a drop off lane to come into Old Stage Road. We're going to complete that uh, section of pavement through there. I don't know whether it's structurally, the, the existing pavement is uh, structurally uh, uh, adequate to accommodate traffic, but this project's going to rebuild it to make sure that it is. And so what I understand for the conditions on the cap of the 944, because this thing project is going to go over for a period of time, and, and God knows what those traffic implications are except for the warehousing. But if you had a, a convenience store and a gas station like a Wawa, uh, how many uh, trips would that get for that cap about? A Wawa at this site would take about a third of the traffic, a little more. Third? Yes, sir. So that's 300 of the 944? Uh, Wawa, the, with using the current trip generation book, the standard Wawa comes in around 330 or 40 trips. Okay, so we built the Wawa. We got 944, but we took 300 off, so we now have 644. How do we make sure that the next one's coming in? Does that a planning director issue that, that he has to take a look at each of these master plans? Well, our proffers are that, it, that it's all cumulative. Every site plan that comes in has to do a phasing plan. So conceivably, this development could happen all at once. If, in fact, a Wawa wanted to come in first, that Wawa is going to have to build most of Old Stage Road immediately. And that capacity may accommodate some more stuff, but the first person coming in on this project is looking to rebuild Old Stage Road. There's, there's no other way to phase it. That's six lanes. Uh, it's six lanes at Route 30. It drops off uh, to about, uh, I think it's four, uh, four lanes at the first roundabout. And then from the first roundabout to the second, it's down to a two-lane road. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Tom. If I could just, uh, to add to that, in the actual proffers, it does require for each site plan to include the current trip generation within the Enterprise Center. 
So that's practically how the county tracks how close they are to the cap. And, and the planning director gets to chop off on this yes or no. So by any chance, if they did break the 944, what happens? Doesn't get approved. It wouldn't get to that point. Okay. Yep. Thank you. I think that's all the questions I have. Dr. Rose? Yeah, I have a, a, and maybe this is uh, for Mr. Williams, a, another follow-up question on the traffic issue. Um, th does the traffic study really end at the boundary of this plan? Uh, and the reason I ask is some of the concerns I've heard in this area, I mean, if you go north on 30, it goes down to a, a two-lane road, 55 miles per hour. If you're going through there at 45 miles per hour. How does your traffic study include some of these safety issues that go beyond sort of the boundary of this plan? I'll let uh, Mr. Williams sort of uh, c clean up my answer, but I'll give you just a, a layperson's high level, you know, uh, sort of explanation. And that that is, this was required to be, a, 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 given its proximity to the interstate, a, a particular kind of traffic study called a 527 study, which is a much more comprehensive study and, and has, you know, broader ranging um, uh, sort of uh, re review of, of uh, intersections, of, of affected intersections, affected uh, areas of, of the adjacent road network um, or the nearby road network. Uh, in addition to that, so that's one thing, so he can walk you through all, you know, the breadth of the, the um, traffic infrastructure that was analyzed to, to have, you know, impacts unique to this project. It is also required to include is, uh, as sort of what we call background traffic, uh, not only the existing traffic conditions, you know, what's on the road today, but a growth rate which is higher than what is proven out to be. It's a, with a margin of safety, so a growth in the existing traffic over time, which happens. It just we have uh, assumed a, a, a more aggressive growth rate than has historically proven out in, in, to be conservative. Um, and that's typical. I mean, I'm not sort of suggesting we did something special. That is typical of traffic studies to, to include a conservative or more aggressive growth rate to, to get a conservative picture of, of traffic impacts. And then also, on top of that, to make sure that you specifically include the traffic impacts of known development. For example, in this case, Stonehouse. Uh, which we know is an approved project, uh, you know, anticipated to generate in addition, uh, an additional traffic up to another, I think it's 1,800 homes, maybe 2,000 homes, um, uh, as well as some uh, uh, commercial industrial uses. And then also Moss Creek, which is another approved project, a commercial project near the intersection of Stonehouse. So it's, it, you know, it's sort of layering in existing traffic projected forward over the life of when this development is expected to occur, uh, along with all the other traffic that's uh, that's been approved and but not built in that corridor, and if that is not responsive, which I'm sure it, it may be only partially responsive, Dexter can kind of give you a better. Yeah, uh, and, and if, if we could go to a slide that shows the overall development, because the area you're talking about is associated with the village center. Uh, so that, that probably goes back to one of the first slides. Um, this development is, is paying for improvements on Old Stage Road and the widening of, uh, of uh, Route 30 in this immediate vicinity. Um, we, we don't have a slide that shows like the different development locations. Uh, you had the one with the pink. Uh, back back one, and that that may be the best one we've that's got. The blue one. Yeah, that's the He's best we've the got. So, at the north end there, that circle is around Barnes Road. Uh, the the yellow circle at the north end that was included in the study. Uh, of course, we don't that uh, village center doesn't have any de development traffic on Barnes Road. No access. Um, what's not shown there is another intersection that was in the study between Barnes Road and Fieldstone, that's Moss Creek. And Moss Creek is another proposed development that's a signalized intersection. Uh, that actually does in include some widening to the north of Fieldstone for Moss Creek. So that's planned to be a signal between those two points. Now, the reality is that doesn't meet anything like VDOT spacing. The Moss Creek was zoned by the county, I think, in 2008. 
or six, thereabouts. Uh, so when Moss Creek redevelops, the likelihood is they're going to be put, if, if they develop and if they get a signal approved, they in all likelihood are going to have to put that signal at Barnes Road. So that, that whole dynamic for that end of it, uh, we didn't put any access on that section of the road. I think we have a, uh, I don't think we even have a right turn in and out on that section. So we're not putting any of our access uh, points, our, tur our essentially our turbulence, where we create turning movements and that sort of thing. We're not anywhere that near that end. That's really getting into the Moss Creek area, and any extension of what this project's doing north is really what Moss Creek's going to have to build because we stayed away from any access in that vicinity. Mr. Krupp? Um, and this is a question for uh, either the applicant or maybe the staff, and I just want to go back to Mr. Polster's analogy of the Wawa and the fact that that could take up a third of the 944 peak vehicle trips. I just want to um, verify that, say the first couple feeders to the trough were very high vehicle trip generators, a Wawa and a, and a couple others that, that took up a relatively, say, less than half of your proposed development. If other applicants came forward, then you, Mr. Trander, your clients could go forward and propose um, uh, amendments to the proffers or conditions that could raise that cap. And if the Board of Supervisors ultimately decided that those um, additional applicants coming in and wanting to develop there were of significant strategic value to the county, that 944 could be raised. Is that theoretically true? Yes, it is theoretically possible. Um, being where we are with this application, a uh, um, couple of years into it, um, I'm skeptical that that would be practically feasible, but theoretically, uh, that's true. Just to, to maybe put a, a more practical uh, response out there for you to consider is that it, while Dexter uh, in, can can weigh in um, to correct me if he disagrees or supplement as he directs, while uh, a user like and I, a convenience store with gas station is a high traffic generation uh, trip generation user. Um, that was factored into our analysis. I mean, we expected to have high traffic generation in our commercial. That still leaves um, considerable development potential. I know, you know, you talk about a third of the trips gone to one, you know, fairly small parcel, you know, two, two, three acre site out of, but the, and Dexter can walk you through, but the light industrial and business users are much lower in, in traffic generation, considerably lower. So um, our, development limits are based on our ability, you know, uh, uh, the ability to accommodate uh, large uh, light industrial users and, and to build out the project even with, you know, a, a convenience store with gas stations sucking up a third of the trips. I think that's yes, and Once again, as Tim explained at the, at the beginning, before I came to the county, uh, I looked at this quarter in terms of what's realistic uh, layers of, of improvements. These are all uh, conventional, typical types of add-ons, add a lane pavement here, add a lane of pavement there. There are more extravagant types of intersections. VDOT has a list of alternative or what once called innovative intersections. They're more expensive. They're, they're, uh, they prohibit turning movements. Uh, they're, they're more complicated uh, and much more expensive. So, if in the future there's, there's an attractive use here, there are ways to increase that capacity, but the dollars per trip accommodated goes up. And so this is more of a ground fit level of improvements. And we, once again, we backed into the amount of development that will fit with that level of improvements. You can bump it up another notch, but you go from millions of dollars of improvements to tens of millions of dollars of improvements. And it's possible. And it, it, that may be something that's attractive to the county in the future. There's nothing to preclude changes in the future. Thank you, sir. Dr. Rose? I, I do have a couple more questions for the applicant. Um, the first one, in our materials, it mentions uh, the LEED certification and that the development would use the standards set by the LEED certification and work towards those. 
without going through the actual application process. Can you explain a little more what that means and, and what the vision is for working towards lead certification in this sure. development? Probably lean on uh, our uh, green building conscience, Mr. Hopke, to sort of explain uh, the commitment there. I will try to explain the uh, uh, green building initiatives, but they there are various standards, but the kind of the gold standard is LEED, L-E-E-D, and it's a scoring system um, that uh, is applied to building, which is sort of the obvious one, but there's also points that you get for adding a bike rack and things like that, for sustainability and, and uh, integrating uh, integrating the building and, and uh, integrating uh, integrating the buildings into the community. Um, so uh, in order to get, uh, you, you have to keep track of all of these points and then you've complied with them and then apply uh, to the uh, uh, Green Building Council and they verify everything and then give you an award. Uh, generally, uh, it's an expensive process to go through and uh, so many people opt as the county does, uh, uh, and as we're proposing, uh, to simply, you know, follow the routine, but not go through the application process uh, with the Green Building Council. I, I, I got that. I'm curious what, what the vision is to, there was no real detail on what that meant in terms of this development and what, your, what the development was going to embrace in terms of reducing the environmental impact. And, some, and I hope it goes beyond just adding some bike racks because Nobody's going to bike to this place given the amount of traffic that's going to be generated here. So, Actually, so I what bike is the idea? there all the time. What's that? <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's a nice area to bike through, actually. And the, uh, the Spine Road is going to have a multi-use trail uh, on it, uh, which actually is designed to give you flexibility because uh, designing something that is sustainable can mean many different things, and there are many ways, different ways to do it. And one thing I would add to that is um, that there are some very specific, as you probably saw, commitments to, uh, to environmental stewardship in the project in addition to that green building standard, you know, water conservation standards, for example, uh, is, is one example of, of those. Um, turf management programs and, and other things that limit the amount of, uh, of uh, chemicals that are put down on for lawn maintenance and the, the ability uh, limits on the ability to use water for irrigation and those types of things and it is um, I think John would agree that um, It's it's not possible to achieve the level of, uh, of uh, Points within lead that we've committed to without doing substantive uh, You know green building Elements Okay. Uh, my final question and it, it might be directed to mr. Hazelwood uh, first, I appreciate you coming here and sharing your family's history and, and your commitment to the county. Uh, something that stood out in the proposal is this idea of a fast food restaurant. And the reason it stood out for me is because we've sat here as commissioners and heard over and over the importance of the rural character, especially in this part of James City County. Mm -hmm. And it, it struck me as a missed opportunity here uh, in, where you could have said instead of bringing in a high rent uh, fast food restaurant that makes the character of this place basically generic and the same as any place you'd see around the country, that there was an opportunity to think about how you can engage local businesses and give them an opportunity to come in here and provide food that wasn't a, one mm -hmm. of the uh, fast food chain, for example. And I'm wondering if that was ever a consideration as a way to better in integrate into the rural character and provide some more local opportunities for local businesses to get a, a leg up where they wouldn't normally be able to because rents are too high in so many of the developed areas around James City County. I'll uh, respond to that and let Larry weigh in if he, he chooses to. But um, first and foremost, there is no preclusion in this project. I mean, we, the, the neat thing about this project, uh, as I sort of suggested earlier, is that we don't have our end users identified. You know, what we're trying to avoid is sprawling unplanned development. 
that uh, is not reflective of the stewardship commitment that the Hazelwood siblings made to their father. Just be flat out candid, right? Mm -hmm. And um, they are, you know, they're they are mortal, and they are aging. And when it goes to their children, uh, it will be developed in the most efficient way possible. And I've described for you how that would look. Um, under a plan like this, um, first of all, you know, this, you know, the the discussion of the preservation of rural lands, this is B1 zone property that just hasn't been developed yet, okay? Um, you know, it is not within the rural lands as, as is designated by the comp plan. You know, it is uh, a property adjacent to a major interstate interchange and a gateway to the county. Uh, it is uh, within the primary service area and designated economic opportunity. Um, it has uh, one or two convenience stores with gas stations uh, adjacent to it and one fast food restaurant, uh, none of which, uh, and, and, a, and another fast food restaurant, I believe, approved across the street but not built. None of, uh, at least the existing, uh, to be uh, representative of, of the character of James City County and, and a gateway to the project. Um, you know, a by right uh, development scenario would only do more to perpetuate that and, and, and be, a, in, in my humble opinion, a travesty. What, what we have proposed is a commercial center that distinguishes itself, that takes, as you saw from those pictures, those weren't pictures that, of the commercial area and of what those fast food restaurants or local businesses were they to come to the table. So there's equal opportunity uh, is, is to your question for those local businesses to, to come and, and present their proposal. Uh, there is no commitment to any fast food or other end user. Um, and what we represented in the terms of architecture was taking the best of the character of James City County and, and having those face uh, sort of internally to the project, uh, not be sort of outward facing, you know, eyesores on, on commercial corridors, um, but to try to take what uh, has, has been shown in the county, been accepted in the county in the past as, as high quality retail development and to replicate that. Now there is a cost to that, right? There's a cost to that. So. Um, it, it, there's a cost to these traffic improvements, and, and that has to be uh, reflected in the rents. That, you know, it has to be economically feasible, right? So um, I can't say that it'll be, you know, a, a real cheap place for, for local businesses to come, but there is certainly an equal opportunity for local businesses to come, and, and nobody is looking to, uh, to exclude them. Any other questions for the applicant? Yes. Um, I, I have a question about the buffering, going back to Mr. Polster's question. Particularly in land area six, the corner of Old Stage Road and Leisure Road, which is now farmland. Um, what's the plan for staging the buffering along Leisure Road in the area that's not now buffered at all? Because um, as you said, and I, I applaud your saying this, um, the developments inside this property would be largely invisible to neighboring properties. And so at what point would the development be largely invisible to those who now see straight into the farmland? Sure. I think it's a, a fairly small section uh, of Leisure Road. I don't have the exact uh, linear footage, Ms. Leverance, that, uh, that is untreated, that is without existing vegetation on Leisure Road. But you are absolutely correct. There is a small section near the intersection of Leisure Road and Old Stage Road that is, is presently un, unbuffered, if you will, by an existing mature uh, you know, tree, treed um, area. It, it is uh, agricultural fields. Um, the, that buffer, as we said, would have to be 100 feet in width and would have to be, uh, be uh, populated with uh, new plantings to, um, to, to meet the county's uh, requirements in, in the ordinance, which is an enhanced buffering requirement. And uh, I, I am candidly not sure of the, the staging of that and when that would be triggered. It certainly would be triggered by any site plan for development of that land bay, which I, I think is area six or land bay six. So before any development could occur in that section of the project, the site plan would be required to reflect that supplemental buffering. Sorry for that. I'm just building off of what Mr. Tran had said. That's correct. It, the way the language reads, it says that prior to final approval of any site plan, so that's before the site plan's approved. Um, the planning director will review and approve a landscape plan for the entire land area. 
and that's where the 100 foot uh, vegetated buffer would have to be shown on the plan. And so that would be along Leisure Road, which is abutting land area six. Mr. Weisong, could you talk about um, the, I guess it was 40 foot evergreen trees and evergreen trees and shrubs that um, presumably would form some kind of screening for that 100 foot buffer. Um, it takes a while for trees to grow to 40 feet. Um, is the county's plan to in fact have that be a screening buffer? Uh, yes, ma'am. The, the way that the condition language is written, it actually would, it's a, I believe a 10% increase for the mix of evergreen plantings and in, a, in the design would be so that there'd be greater screening from Leisure Road and the way that the language reads, it even has that at least 45% of evergreen trees would have to achieve a minimum height at maturity of 40 feet. And so when the landscape plan comes in, the planners would review that to make sure that that mixture includes the correct trees that would meet and fulfill that condition once the trees okay. are grown. So the understanding is that the evergreens wouldn't necessarily just be um, pine trees that would just have their greenery at the top, but also hollies that are green all the way down. So the understory would also be screened. <coughs> uh, yes, ma'am, it would be trees and shrubs at a mixture that would provide screening. I don't wanna to weigh too much into the landscape ordinance specifically, right. but okay. I believe that is the intent. That, that's my biggest concern. And then I have a question for Mr. Trant about what's going to be um, going on in land area six between now and any time that it might be developed. Will it just go fallow? As Ms. Leverance, there is uh, no immediate plans to change the land use uh, on the property. Uh, generally, it, not just in land bay six or land area six or development area six. Um, the, the only change that would be foreseeable is a progressive uh, development approach. So we, we, we would be setting about um, in the very near term to try to identify uh, the initial users of the property. And, uh, and there would be some development work that would have to go on. Mr. Williams has described some of that, mostly traffic and infrastructure improvements, water and sewer, to position the property for development. Most of that would occur sort of north of, of Leisure Road in and around the, the two intersection points that are, are shown for access to this project. So the main spine road and the, and the entrance to the commercial area is where uh, development would likely occur first. The only other limitation or, or, or influence on the, the current land use of the property is that the, uh, the farmer that has been farming the property it has indicated to the family that he is approaching retirement. He hasn't um, raised the white flag yet, but, but every year and, and when they have the conversation about whether he's coming back, um, it, it's discussed. So it is possible that, that he might cease to farm the property you know, before it is actually developed. Okay, so then it could possibly just become overgrown and be you know, shrubs and trees sprout up on their own. That, that is correct. Uh, okay. That's very helpful. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions for the applicant? Thank you, Mr. Trant. So before we move on, ma'am, this is, ma'am, this is not the time for that. So if you have comments for the Planning Commission, we'll be getting to that in a moment, okay? Uh, so this isn't a back and forth. So when we get to the public hearing, if you have comments or questions, you can address it to the commission as we go. So, so before we continue with the planning um, public hearing, I would just like to say thank you for the indulgence to allow us to get through this. Um, obviously, this is a big application and a lot to digest. So. Um, and given the changes in the application from the original side, from the original application to tonight's submittal, if by chance you're at the last public hearing and have some additional comments, um, we would allow you to make those com to make comments again tonight. So, um, given that, we'll start with uh, our speaker cards, and the first one I have, and just a reminder. Um, we ask that you address the commission. It's not a back and forth between the applicants and 
and um, and the commission. It's not a back and forth between the citizens and the commission. It's our opportunity to hear your comments. And if you do have questions, we might have the opportunity to address it in our discussion. So uh, individuals have five minutes. If you're representing a group, you have up to 15 minutes to speak. So our first speaker tonight is Linda Rice. She's representing a group. So Ms. Rice. Thank you. Um, before I start, I would just like to thank the members of Friends of Forge Road and Toano who are attending tonight. They might not want to raise their hands or whatever, but um, we've been sitting here quite a while, so I um, are very appreciative of their indulgence. Um, my name is Linda Rice. I live on 2394 Forge Road in Toano. Um, it has been interesting to me to hear uh, the Hazelwood family extol how many years they have, uh, how many generations they have had in the area, and I think that is certainly noteworthy um, because I've lived in this greater Williamsburg area for uh, 50 years, but with that, and on Forge Road for 44. Um, so I would like to say, as, as nice as that is, I would also point out that we have other folks who have lived in this area for quite a while, um, who have paid their taxes, and who also have a great deal of interest in preserving the rural lands that drew them initially to the upper county, myself included. I grew up in central New Jersey, so I know the difference between suburban sprawl and rural lands. I think all of you received um, the comments that Friends of Forge Rose submitted. And um, I'm not gonna bother, of course, to read through all of these, but I am going to try to um, organize my comments based on the, uh, the headings. And um, one of the first things that I, I think that so many citizens are concerned about is that if this project is in fact approved or recommended by the Planning Commission and then eventually sent to the board for approval, it would probably be the largest development project ever submitted in James City County. And if it's not the largest, it's certainly one of the largest. And I say that because the decision that you make tonight or the recommendation that you make tonight is going to have some very far-reaching consequences. Not only uh, consequences for the proposed uh, developer, but consequences for the residents that live in this upper county. And even though Forge Road is a bit of a distance from where this project is being, or Toana for that matter, is a bit of a distance from where this project is being proposed, I think no citizen that lives in this area should feel that they're not going to be impacted in some way. Something I'd like to point out, um, Mr. Trant tends to uh, characterize this project as um, land that's been primarily B1 and sort of a lesser amount of A1. That's not entirely true. When we were doing our sum totals of this, roughly there's about 50% of the land that is currently zoned uh, A1. So I just wanted to make that very clear. Um, and that is uh, the reason um, that I bring that up is because of the matter of so many people living in the immediate area being attracted to the fact that there is that, or there has been that A1 property. The next thing that I'd like to bring up is the, um, the very overbroad uses that are being suggested. We now have approximately, with this amendment that's been made, 3.3 uh, million square feet being proposed of uh, warehouse space and then this additional um, additional uh, footage uh, related to the SUP. If you look at just 3.3 million square feet, which is just kind of staggering in many ways, um, I did a quick calculation using Google. 
That's roughly equivalent to 55 and a half football fields. So wrap your head around that. It gives you an idea of the expanse um, that uh, this project could entail. Um, the other thing about it is that even though Mr. Trant has tended to minimize um, some of the uh, proposals for the SUP, uh, my question would be, why in the world of all of the uh, possible SUP uses that you could propose, would you put something in like textile, uh, a textile production facility or heavy machinery servicing? I mean, certainly that is not to me keeping with the, uh, the general character of the area. Another important thing, and I know all of you have been, <coughs> excuse me, deeply involved with this comprehensive plan update. And uh, certainly all of us with Friends of Forge Road credit you with that because the amount of time is enormous. But with that said, this project is not in conjunction with the wishes of the vast majority of citizenry. And what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is when you have done your numerous, uh, I think, three public engagement meetings and other citizen surveys, um, and this is a quote uh, that Tammy Rosario gave, and I of the Virginia Gazette in March of 2021, the overwhelming desire of the citizenry was to prioritize the protection of natural lands and open spaces. So with that said, I understand the project proposal of buffering and that sort of thing, but that buffering is minuscule compared to, I think, what the um, desires, if you will, overwhelming desires of the citizenry of this county um, really are. And I'm not just talking about the citizens of the upper county, gentlemen and ladies. I am talking about the James City County residents overall, lower county, mid county, and upper county. Um, so continuing with that, um, there is another uh, aspect of this. Uh, we keep hearing about the fact that in the comp plan, uh, this area was uh, designated as economic opportunity. I may, might add to the people in the audience and to some of the listeners, I know all of the professionals are aware of this, even though you have that designation, that doesn't mean that property is zoned in that manner. And I think people are getting very confused with that. And of course, that's one of the reasons that Mr. Trant is proposing this rezoning. But right now, the economic opportunity designation is really a vision. It's a vision of what we, uh, in the county, if you will, the county staff, to some extent the county citizenry, have said, OK, this might be um, appropriate for this piece of land. However, there is nothing in that vision that really mandates the rezoning that's being suggested. Um, the other thing I'd like to point out, because some of you are aware of this as well, we have had this EO designation now for several years. And the one that I point out most significantly is Hill Pleasant Farm. Some of you may be aware of it, some of you may not. Um, that was the old, I call it the old apple farm in Norwich. Um, the Hunt family uh, also um, agreed to have that designation, and I, I think it was a rezoning. What happened, and this is to me a caveat in this whole proposal that's going forward, is that Mr. Hunt and his family did not have any developers rushing in to make use of that rezoning, even though you had rail and road systems um, abutting that property. What he's done instead, and I applaud him for this, is that they've put a solar farm in. And um, I know he mentioned years ago to me that this was one of the things that his, his children really were desiring of. They did not want to see it uh, developed, even though they, they couldn't farm the land themselves. So I just point that out again. EO designation does not necessarily mandate rezoning. Um, in terms of the adverse impacts, and I hope I'm not running out of time, I know we've talked a lot about traffic. And if, frankly, if I was residing in Stonehouse or Meadow Lake or Michelle Point or some of these other developments surrounding there, I would be extremely con uh, concerned about the traffic impacts. You're talking about at least four signals from what I understand. And um, 
it, I know it's very hard for people to have uh, in their minds, um, I'm going to say conceptually, what that really means. But what that means ultimately is you're going to be looking at a road that's going to be turned into, at its best, at its best, Monticello Avenue, and at its worst, ultimately, Denby Boulevard. And that's, you know, that's not hyperbole on my part. I've lived down in the Newport News area as well. Um, and then, as I think one of the gentlemen um, mentioned, uh, just recently, the Development Re Review Committee <coughs> approved at least 600 new homes in the, in the Stonehouse um, development. Um, I don't know if that was really factored into the traffic analysis, which I might add was dated January of 2019, not current. But nevertheless, that's another consideration in this. Um, another one that I find troubling is water use. We have a lot of private wells in the upper county. And I have talked to uh, JCSA, and I've also talked to uh, Ms. Wainwright with VDH. At this point in time, we don't even know how many private wells really exist in Upper James City County. And you say, well, why are you concerned about that? Because James City County is a groundwater county. That means all of our water is coming from an aquifer. Think of all the straws that are going to that aquifer to include private wells or to include what is going to be some sort of commercial or industrial enterprise if this project goes forward. Um, I fail to believe that that will not ultimately have some impacts on water. And JCSA, the engineer there, did mention that, um, of course, they're going to be looking at this very carefully in terms of water usage how much withdrawal can, be, uh, can occur because of the DEQ permits. But nevertheless, at this point in time, we really, and they, JCSA can't really say for sure if there will be an impact or not. And I'm talking here somewhat long range, but some of us may not be here like Mr. Hazelwood has been talking about because he's in his 70s, well, I'm in my 70s too. But necessarily, I worry about the long-term impacts of such a major project. And I also wanted to mention noise impacts. Um, from what I heard from Mr. Marston at one of the community meetings, there's not going to be any sound barrier walls erected, um, certainly in these areas <coughs> where the residences are fairly close um, to, the, to the main property. Um, I really don't think that um, natural uh, boundaries such as uh, forestry or um, ravines or whatever are going to be adequate buffers. And nobody is planning to do any type of uh, testing of decibel levels or whatever. If you have uh, textile mill operation going in or whatever, warehousing with traffic, I will guarantee you the people that are in residing near there are going to have noise impacts. And finally, something that I think is extremely important and we haven't mentioned enough, we keep talking about the Hazelwood family and their values and their interest in getting, if you will, money from uh, this development. Well, what about the effects on the surrounding property values of these other people that have bought in the Supper County with the anticipation, at least, maybe that not everything would, was going to stay rural forever, but certainly in anticipation there would still be some of the, what we, we tend to call rural character. And I think that hasn't really been stated enough either. And um, so finally, I would also say there seems to be a bit of a scare tactic here about continuing to say, if you allow this um, proposal for the Enterprise Center to go forward, um, that is going to be so superior to just uh, looking at what kind of development we would have with just a B, leaving a B1 or A1 designation. And I would just stand before you and say, I don't believe it. Um, I think a master plan sounds great, but on the, in the case of this particular situation, I'm not really sure that this is going to create that much more advantage, if you will, from the standpoint of buffering or traffic controls or whatever that would not just normally occur through the normal uh, review process that the uh, James City County has, which is very good, I might add, um, for a B1 or, or 
you know, a, leaving a B1 or A1 designation. Um, so with that, I thank you for your time. And we heartily hope that you will oppose this rezoning and SUP. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rice. Ellis Colthorpe. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Appreciate your time this evening. My name is Ellis Colthorpe. I live at 4945 Settlers Market Boulevard in Williamsburg. Um, also have a recreational property I frequent on Farmers Drive in Barhamsville, so very familiar with this area. Uh, but here to speak briefly with you, um, I spend my days working on in the industrial sector, commercial real estate, uh, more specifically uh, in the representation of industrial developers. Um, it's been no surprise in the last 18 months that industrial developers have flocked to southeastern Virginia. Um, a lot of that driven by the e-commerce boom that we've seen uh, throughout the coronavirus pandemic. Um, we've also seen it in the widening of the Port of Norfolk and the dredging of the shipping channel. Um, and also recently with the Dominion Offshore Wind Energy project that they're working on. Um, the developers are in the area because the users uh, are here. Um, at a recent meeting with the CEO, Stephen Edwards, of the Port of Virginia, uh, there's a need for about 6 million square feet of industrial warehouse and manufacturing space, um, most of which needs to be within about an hour of the Port of Virginia just for logistical reasons. Um, so this project, um, most developers are having to move further out, 58, into Suffolk. That's really the only place left. If there is industrially zoned property or appropriately zoned property, I should say, most of that's already under contract. Uh, it's driving them further out 58. And so this would give the opportunity for these users uh, to have facilities up 64, uh, most of which the, the infrastructure projects um, from Hampton up, you know, just short of the West Point exit uh, have already been completed. Um, so here today to say that the users are here, the developers are here. Um, I would much rather see that money come to James City County, uh, bring the jobs and the tax revenue. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Colthorpe. Eric Conradi. Good evening, Commission. Um, my name is Eric Conradi. I live at 5 Clarendon Court. I'm also a commercial uh, real estate associate. I do not work for or with the Hazelwood family. I, I, this is more than a, lived here since 1988. I've seen a lot of change on a personal level and a professional level. I think the option is that it's gonna change. This property is not gonna uh, remain as a farmland forever. And I think it's unfair to suggest it should. Um, so if the option is to have this buy right and have, uh, versus having a master plan, I, I know there are some concerns, but I. I there, it's clearly that having a plan would be safer. I think having organized one entrance, way to get in, way to get out, I think it'll look better than having a sort of hodgepodge. Uh, I think it'll uh, have a greater economic um, impact. And I think it'll just look better for James City County and Williamsburg overall. Thank you. So I'm in support. Thank you. On Fuqua. How y'all doing? I just wanted to speak in opposition to this. I've uh, lived in Tawana for right about 15 years, uh, 207 Highfield Drive, right off Old Stage Road. I moved to Tawana because the area was reasonably quiet and rural. That's the appeal. I want it to remain quiet and rural. I believe that development will neg negatively impact the area. I know that uh, to some, this looks on, looks good on paper, but it does not to me. I, uh, excuse me, said, so, you know, this uh, development creates environmental and stormwater concerns for me. I have, uh, believe it's unnecessary 
because there appears to be thousands of square feet of unused warehouse space in the Stonehouse Office Park already. The roundabouts and so-called traffic improvements will create more traffic and more traffic problems. I think we need to protect our open space and rural setting in the upper end of the county. We need farmland. We don't need another Stonehouse Office Park or another Newtown, both of which have unused space and I don't think we need any of this up there. The farmland is uh, is an appeal to everybody at the upper end of the county, as well as people all the way down to the lower end of the county. That's what makes uh, the rural area really great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ed Lampett. Good evening and uh, thank you for having this uh, opportunity for us to talk. Um, I attended the last county meeting here and then the, um, what's it called, the out outreach meeting um, back in December. Uh, my name is Ed Lampett, uh, 2616 Meadow Lake Drive, so I live pretty close. Uh, just wanted to capture a couple thoughts and um, if I were king for a day, I, I wouldn't see it developed. I, I think it does take away from the character of the, the county. Um, it just does, uh, but I accept that development is proper. I'm thankful for the attention that uh, the board has given this area, uh, the work that the Hazelwoods have done uh, to make a comprehensive plan. I think that's good. Um, it's been said that the land has been in their family for 100 years. Uh, I would argue that whatever is decided is going to affect the county for probably another 100 years. Maybe not the exact stores, maybe not the Wawa or whatever comes there, but something's going to be there. Uh, so 100 years back and 100 years forward, and I feel like the decisions are, made, are being made sort of fast. So I guess uh, while I'm in favor of it, I would ask that folks pause a little bit and just think about how we're doing this uh, with partic particular attention on that Bay 6 area. Originally, it was going to be residential. Uh, now, it's just in the span of a couple months or maybe a couple weeks, I don't know, it's turned into uh, just more warehouse or, or more development, whatever that is. And I just wonder, is that not an opportunity that we're missing for the county? Um, whether we're building 300 or 600 homes, whatever it is, in Stonehouse. Uh, I know just last month they talked about no new school. And I'm just going like, how, how is this all happening at the same time where we've got hundreds of acres being developed and we don't have land for a new school. There's not even talk of a new school or expanding the park or doing something else to uh, really leverage that. Really, it's just a tenth, I think. It's, it's uh, 30 acres to create that buffer. I think it would alleviate some of the stresses in the neighborhood there. Uh, in terms of uh, noise pollution, light pollution, just regular trash pollution. Uh, so anyway, th I'm in favor of it. I'm thankful for the plan that's there. I just think maybe it could be a little bit better. And I just wonder how much harm is there in just slowing down a little bit and thinking about how, rather than just uh, toss in that last 30 acres there on Leisure Lane and make it more warehouse space, say, hey, can we do something better with it for the county? That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Kimber Smith. Good evening, Chairman O'Connor, other members of the Planning Commission. Thank you for allowing me to make my comments tonight. My name is Kimber Smith. I reside at 3051 Heritage Landing Road. I'm a long time, uh, both personal and professional friend of the Hazelwood family. Uh, for the sake of brevity and uh, perhaps as a uh, gesture of um, indulgence, I will not repeat all of my remarks tonight <clears throat> from the first planning commission session on the application. But I would like to summarize the points that support recommending the approval of the application. The parcel is designated economic opportunity, as has been pointed out, on the James City County Comprehensive Plan. The comp plan is the blueprint for the county as to how best to utilize the land resources contained in the county 
and has been developed by the county with significant citizen input. The application before us is seeking the very same zoning of EO as designated by the comp plan. The Hazelwood application is the result of years of studies and analysis, as well as input from the county staff. The Hazelwood application includes not only detailed engineering, traffic studies, road improvements, economic analysis, and environmental accommodations, but also includes proffers that will run with the land and obligate all developers of the parcel to comply with these proffers, which are substantial. The application has received the recommendation of the county's planning division, which has extensively reviewed the plan and the supporting studies. The end users of the land will provide much needed diversity to the county's tax base and will provide significant positive cash inflows to the county, as well as desirable employment for the residents of the county. Since the first hearing of this application, the Hazelwood family has removed both the residential component and the truck terminal component from the application as allowable uses as a result of the feedback received from the citizens. The parcel is located immediately adjacent to an Interstate 64 interchange, which is a much better location than parcels located deeper in the county, resulting in fewer traffic complications. The Hazelwood family has set out from day one to plan for and accommodate responsible and orderly development of their family farm and have used the county's comprehensive plan as their guide to do just that. I think this is a rare and highly beneficial opportunity for the county and I highly recommend support of the proposal. Thank you. Bruce Biederman, Biederman. Good evening, members of Planning Council. Appreciate the time to address. I, I speak as an individual homeowner. Uh, I want to bring to your attention a little bit about some irony. I was unfortunately, um, my, our roots go back to 1697 on the Eastern Shore, but I had the misfortune of being born in the fourth largest city in the country. So I fled there and went to Virginia Beach when it was Princess Anne County, and I got to see firsthand what poor planning can do to a community. And if you want a good example, go down the road about 35, 45 minutes and see what has happened to Virginia Beach. It was a patchwork. Uh, they did not put the infrastructure in, 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 uh, in ahead of the, the development. There were backroom deals. Uh, things were done uh, ahead, way ahead of time. And, and here, the irony I want to speak about is I live in what's called the retreat. Um, I hope we don't have to re rename our community. I've got a lot of our neighbors here. They're all three and a half acre lots, if you're not familiar with them. They are on Barnes Road. They just finished selling out. There's 75 lots in there. I moved to Upper County, not Williamsburg, because I'm a refugee from overdevelopment. I left the major city, went to Virginia Beach, watched it get ruined, and I intentionally moved to the Upper County, not Williamsburg, so I would have peace and quiet. I can still hear the interstate where I live, even with my three and a half acres and my 75, 74 neighbors around me. I ask that you absolutely do not make this industrial, warehouse, I'm okay for retail. Funny thing is, we don't even have city water and we have septic systems and you're gonna put an industrial complex right up the road from our development? I think it's absurdity and the irony of it is uh, that we actually live in the retreat. With that, I thank you and I hope you take that under consideration. Thank you. And just a reminder, if you would, um, in addition to giving your name, please give your address too, so. Sorry, I'm falling short on that one tonight. Excuse me, I'm sorry. I, I've got it it's, on your speaker. It's, it's Biderman. I'm at 9120 Manor Woodway, and that's in the retreat in right. Toano. Thank, Thank you. you. So, uh, Jennifer Weinstein. Um, good evening. Um, I am here on behalf of um, 
a board. So I'm going to be reading um, for someone who's ill, wasn't able to get here this evening. Uh, thank you all to the members of the Planning Commission for hearing the concerns of the public with regards to the Enterprise Center project. My name is Jenna, Jennifer Weinstein. I live at 3232 Leighton Boulevard in Toyano, but I'm actually speaking for Darlene Prevish of 2111, I'm sorry, of 211 Old Stage Road, Toyano, Virginia, who is president of the Save Rural James City County. Um, again, as I said, she's ill and wasn't able to be here this evening, um, so I'm speaking for her. The group of nearly 850 concerned local citizens has formed over the last few weeks. We are adamantly opposed to the rezoning of these 328 acres to EL. Hear me when I say we are adamantly opposed. Um, we are all about um, promoting responsible development, but it needs to be done right. We need exits. Um, while working with the developers and citizens to maintain the rural look and feel we love about James City County. We've heard that over and over again from the developers. Um, but we want them to do the right thing. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm, reading, I'm reading her words, so I apologize. Um, they tell us that they are afraid their children will sell it in blocks and pieces instead of working together as they have to do the right thing, and that is what this has to be done now because they're getting older. Newton's third law is for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. I think we need to look at the other side of this because once it's developed, we can't undo it. We had stressed at the last planning commission meeting that we were saddened by the fact that very few citizens were given the opportunity to even know about this project. I had said we would love to be able to sit down and discuss their options that would align with the wishes of the county citizens. Developers, the developers heard me, which I approached, which I appreciated. Again, I'm sorry, I'm reading, I'm reading not my words. <laughs> um, but then we found these three meetings were limited to 45 people, um, 45 persons each, which only gave 135 citizens out of the thousands who would be affected the opportunity to hear their plan. This actually was not an opportunity to try out new ideas, but just an information session. During the session, the citizens were told that the truck terminal was off the board, but they had mentioned Amazon numerous times. So let's visit that scenario. We know that the scope of buildings fits directly into Amazon's model and scope, and its, approx and its proximity to the Richmond Airport for trucking goods in and out of the facility will decrease Amazon's delivery time store area. They have already have a terminal of this size in place in Ashland, and one is being built off Meadow Bridge Boulevard in Mechanicsville, and they have a smaller terminal in the old Kmart in Hampton. This is another midway point and makes sense from their perspective. Amazon is doing this across the country. Our Facebook page has at least five videos and articles of the detriments to the environment to include pollution, noise, lights, emissions, destructions of roads, water sources, and more. This is going to be in our faces. Those on Barnes Road have a thousand feet between them and this monstrosity. Those on Old Stage Road have virtually no buffer. I hear the developers when they say we love James City County, but I don't think they realize their plan will ruin property values and destroy our way of life. There are two who no longer even reside in the area and will not have to live with the consequences of this, and I hope they'll listen. The question for you, however, as representatives of your citizens and county is, does this fit within the wishes of our citizens? Is it necessary and does it meet a need? The first question, does this fit within the wishes of our citizens? The answer is no. 84% of our citizens surveyed in 2019 said that they were not interested in further development, even if that meant their taxes were increased. Even your own comprehensive plan states, both in this, both in this planning process and during outreach and prior comprehensive plans, the citizens of James City County have repeatedly emphasized the great value they place on their rural landscapes, including high premium citizens put on quality of life that deserve, that derive from the county's pristine natural resources, protected open spaces, scenic rural vistas, and historic and traditional small town and village community character. Many are concerned that the pace, pattern, and character of new growth and development may harm this treasured character of the county and may, and many expressed a strong desire to both limit the pace and amount of new development and directed away from rural areas as they so, so, sorry, or as they value so highly. It further states as a community, community character goal, 
The county will be a good steward of the land by preserving and enhancing the scenic, cultural, rural farm, for forestal, natural, architectural, and historic qualities that are essential to the county's distinctive character, economic vitality, and overall health and qualities of its residents. Is it necessary? Again, the answer is no. Whether Amazon is the potential applicant or not, finding people to work is a huge problem. How will they find workers to drive all the way out here? People who work for Amazon and or any warehousing industry typically do not make high-end wages. How are those people going to get to work? By bike? How many people does it take to man a 3.3 million square foot warehouse facility? If you remember from our last presentation, we pointed out that 2.9 million square foot facility would be the equivalent to almost 27 Lowe's or Home Depot stores. Now they have expanded this to 3.3 million. That's massive. How many cars will be driven in and out daily for multiple shifts just to clock in and out? Then how many trucks will be in and out delivering goods? How many vans to distribute goods? We have been told that VDOT will not make improvements until there is a need. Have you seen what the semi-truck traffic has done to the Tallysville exit in New Kent? The roads are torn up, potholes, grooves, and shattered asphalt are everywhere. In 2017, a traffic study was performed which stated that in 2010, there were 5,000 car trips per day between James City County and New Kent County. In 2017, that number had tripled to 15,000 trips daily, and this does not take into account the increase from proposed developments including this project. The third question, does it meet a need? To my mind, the answer is no. Remind yourselves of what things once looked like out near water country before JCPenney, Dick's Sporting Goods, and others came along. Now the land has been stripped. Buildings are empty, including Dick's as of this week. Does it meet a need? If there was a need, why are there hundreds of acres of industrial land already available less than two miles up the road in Toyano Industrial Park, where there's already water. I'm not against Am an Amazon facility if they choose to build one in James City County, but hide it somewhere or use space that's already available. There, are ton there is a ton of cleared land over by the Walmart Distribution Center in Grove, where workers in the right socioeconomic level live and could use public transportation. There will, there will soon be a dedicated um, road leading out of that area to the interstate, which would make that better all the way around. Because there's no real development, there would be as impacted as we would be. A massive commercial development on this 328 acres of rural area is a bad fit for the community. There has to be a better solution for the developers, the county, and its citizens. Why do we only imagine progress to include buildings? Is it worth the impacts to traffic, which will make this corridor a nightmare for residents of New Kent West, and West Point? who travel here to shop, to the residents who, have, who live here already, and to the tourists who travel through the area. Whenever I travel to North, I never go through Norva. I use Route 301 to go around it if I'm trying to travel up to Maryland, or I use Route 17 to get along 81 to head northwest. I perform more driving than time sitting in traffic. Do we want to defer traffic to take Route 460 to get to the Outer Banks to avoid our area, avoid Bush Gardens area, which is already backed up with traffic, and the HRBT? Will more traffic headaches enhance our local tourism, or will it deter it? I already, we already have a problem, and this will compound it. Water is another problem, and a project of this size will only add to it. It will not expand on, I will not expand on this because you already know this. Noise will be a huge problem to residents nearby. The current plan proposals proposes inadequate buffers, which again will make the properties surrounding this project undesirable for later resale. There's already been extensive growth in James City County, way too much growth if the goal is to truly preserve Upper County's rural areas. In the past six years alone, some of the future projects that have already been approved um, our, um, a solar farm on the Hill Pleasant farm in Norge, a solar farm in, I guess there's another, another solar farm in Norge, um, rezoning and primary service area for extension of the Taylor farm at Anderson's Corner, Moss Creek Shopping Center, and a Wendy's restaurant next to the Star Gas Station on 227. So to conclude, how much more do we need? We should not, we, we should not slow down, should we not slow down a bit and see how all this affects the community? the safety, the rural character, et cetera, before we proceed. Could some of this land land be um, allocated for support services? Could we, could we imagine allocation for future schools, park expansions similar to the WISC? 
These could border the community spaces and hide any large scale development behind buffers, making sure to protect the rural roads like Barnes Road and Old Stage Road from becoming through fares. Could we fix this by cutting off Barnes Road at the S curve and cutting off Old Stage Road at Leisure Road and providing a safe exit at another point along Route 30 for the residents and development along Old Stage Road? Would adding speed bumps be a solution or ideas? Um, these ideas and others are ones we should consider before writing another black, blank check and hoping it all works as planned. Um, to the developers, we ask this. Pull, pull this back to the table for a minute. Work with us so that we all win. You've said you love this area and you love the community you live in and work with us. You say you're trying to honor your father's wishes. Tell your children to honor your wishes if you truly mean what you say. You've said this will take years. What's a few more months to get it right? To the Planning Commission, we ask this. Do not recommend the rezoning in its current form. You have heard all of this depending on the order of this presentation and probably will hear more reasons why this is not a good fit in this location. Say no to rezoning. This is the wish of your citizens. It is part of your own comprehensive plan and I think you know in your hearts it's not quite ready for the approval. The developers have done a lot of work here but this is more that there's more to do. For every action there is an equal and, op and opposite reaction. This decision will change our beloved James City County forever, and it's not, and it's worth taking our time to do it right. Save rural James City County and say no to rezoning at this time. Thank you for your um, listening and to our thoughts. And just as me being a citizen living in Whitehall, um, I see what happens when there's an accident on 64 already when you're going up to New Kent and you go through all of those developments. I don't want to see people coming through Whitehall to avoid traffic that's going to be backed up on 30. And that eventually is going to happen, and that's just on my end. So I would um, highly oppose this. Thank you. Thank you. Kelly Wagnitz. My name is Kelly Wagnitz, and I have lived in Toano for about 16 years. The story I'm about to share with you is mine. October 5, 2012, I was traveling westbound on Route 30, passing Fieldstone Parkway with my left blinker on to turn onto Barnes Road. As I waited for oncoming traffic to pass, another vehicle was barreling up behind me and appeared to not be slowing down at all. Before I could react, this vehicle slammed into the back of me at what police reports said to be 70 miles per hour, causing my car to be pushed into oncoming traffic and hit head on by a full-size Dominion power truck at what police reports said to be 55 miles per hour. I was instantly thrown out of my seat backwards, almost being ejected out of my back window, but luckily was thrown into my back seat, where I somehow had the thought to cover my face from the shattered glass and debris flying throughout my car and everywhere around me. Once my car stopped spinning, I was helped out of the window of my car, which I could see from the inside was internally cracked in half. The suspension of my car was ripped out from underneath, I was a victim of a hit and run from the first car that hit me. Afterwards, fire and rescue were on the scene and I was taken to Riverside Hospital's trauma unit for CAT scans and to treat minor injuries. I had no serious injuries, but the impact it had on me was debilitating. At first, I was afraid to even drive a vehicle. I would go on to have anxiety and flashbacks while in a vehicle. I still consider myself very lucky. There have been many accidents in that spot that have not been as lucky. On October 28, 2020, I was traveling down Barnes Road during route, uh, towards Route 30 mid-morning. When I reached the end, I had to turn around. This is because an accident occurred earlier that morning. There was police tape surrounding the scene and a funeral home van parked in the middle of the road. What I saw next, I hope no one has to witness in their life. There's something different about seeing someone in the road that was just alive hours ago. The stoplights proposed will do nothing for those entering and exiting Barnes Road. When you increase traffic, which will surely happen as people travel in and out of New Kent County to shop and work at these locations without responsibly looking at all the consequences, you would be being negligent. It has been repeatedly asked that this rezoning be denied and I'm asking yet again. This happened to me without extra traffic. How many more will suffer similar or more dire consequences? These statements are a matter of public record now. 
If you ignore these warnings, any attorney can go to court now and say you knew the dangers, but ignore them because a developer told you the story they wanted you to hear, and all you saw was dollar signs this county could gain, not the cost to the lives of your constituents. Not to mention the regret you would have if it was one of your children or loved ones who fell victim to a similar situation in that area. I would like to add that I'm a member of Save Rural James City County and support the Save Rural James City County movement. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Kyle Seal. As I open my phone to get my notes, my name is Kyle Andrew Seal, a resident uh, of Stonehouse at 3248 Oak Branch Lane in Tawana. Um, I open <clears throat> just with um, my sentiment and my takeaways from this, uh, and basically my takeaways from the community around me. Uh, every day I drive through Williamsburg to go get lunch, uh, which is a agreement that I've had with myself uh, living in this area, that it is a bit of a drive to go get lunch, which that is an agreement that everyone that lives in that area has made by moving there. And we all understand that we are a bit of a ways away from anything better than McDonald's and such. On my way there, I pass the Pottery. I pass the uh, Harris Theater Shopping Center, which to my recollection is, I believe, about 45% empty, I'd say, a little less than half or so. Uh, a lot of those areas are just empty. Uh, you see up by where Dix was, J.C. Penney. Uh, all these areas, people are not flocking to. People are not shopping in person really anymore. I was a person that would prefer to go to a store and see people and to check out with a person, not self-checkout. Go to Walmart, that sort of thing. But with COVID and such, that's a really hard task to uh, do, especially being that my father has a uh, brain tumor that uh, causes his, uh, basically, um, self-protective system, I can't think of the word currently, uh, to be um, damaged. And so if I do catch COVID or any type of uh, disease like that, he's very much easily taken out. Uh, so I shop online, so does my mother, so do many people that I know, because going out and shopping really isn't something that a lot of people do anymore. That's why places like Amazon have gotten so uh, popular. Um, and I understand that development is something that is potentially going to happen in this area. Uh, I am very much against it because we moved to this area because of its rural uh, feeling, its uh, rural attitude. Uh, the entire area is just nice. It's scenic. I like seeing farmland. I grew up around farmland. I love going down Forge Road. Sometimes I won't even take uh, Richmond Road to get home in Stonehouse because of the fact that I like going down some of these side roads, some of these back roads, to see that landscape, to see that area. Uh, I fear, uh, as stated before, with the uh, 64 backups that cause the Richmond Road backups, uh, my drive to work is only maybe 10 minutes, maybe 12 minutes. I'm going slow. When that area gets backed up, I have to take alternative routes. That means sometimes going all the way up to Stonehouse and pretty much going all the way up into Norwich to come back around to go to the place that I work at, American Pride Automotive. Uh, that area back up, backs up fast, and anybody will tell you that that lives there. And that is one of my fears uh, of the people making decisions for this development, is the fact that I'm not sure how many people that make the decisions about where we live actually live there or enjoy the area. I enjoy it every day because I live there, and that's why I want to be there is because it is rural and because I see this area every day. I do not want to go through the traffic issues and the multiple accidents stated earlier that I have seen. I do not want to be a victim of that. I don't want my sister to be a victim of that, uh, and neither of my parents. Uh, so I do um, plead that you um, go against the notion of moving forward, uh, or at least take a pause and realize some of the impact that this is going to have on the area, uh, being that the given data set of the immediate area around it shows not very much success for local businesses. Uh, it's just not a trend that we're seeing currently. It's not the way that things are moving nationally and on a small scale around us, they are not moving that direction either. So I thank you for your time and I hope you guys have a good evening. Thank you. 
Last speaker card I have tonight is Gary Massey. My name is Gary Massey. I live at 8644 Mary Oaks Lane, and I travel from there to exit 227. That is my exit where I get on and off the interstate. Old Stage Road is my road, I think, because it's the one I travel on. I wrote you a letter when you initially had this application in favor of it. Uh, in this case, I went to the meeting at the library at James City County, looked at the most recent revisions, and then I looked at the staff report you got. I, I think you all had like 693 pages in your reading packet. It's online, it's a PDF, and my computer sat there and churned for a while trying to download it. I've, I've had the good fortune to live in James City County since 1957. I love James City County. I don't, I don't want to leave. And I'm, not, I'm really not sure why I'm emotional right this minute. Because I really want to talk to you about this project and the opportunity you have as planning commissioners. The points I outlined in the letter are fine. You can read those as planners and make your own judgment on them. But I think this is a great opportunity for the county. It's in accordance with the comprehensive plan. And I've had the opportunity to sit where you all sit and make decisions about projects that are put before you here on the Planning Commission. It's a great responsibility. And I appreciate the fact that you read those 693 pages and then sit through these meetings, take all of our information, and then make an informed decision. But this is a real opportunity for the county to define what we're going to do with this property. We ask for it to be economic opportunity. All of the proposed uses are economic opportunities. They're chances for employment. And most importantly, they will increase our tax base without requiring much in the way of services. And why do I think that's important? Because I'm one of those citizens that likes all these services that we get, and I love it when other people can pay for those services. And this application does that for all of us in James City County. So as much as I love James City County, I love it even better when the brewery came in and paid for all the services that I have now. Other industrial developments and commercial developments have come into this community and pay for my library and pay for my parks and pay for my emergency services. I mean, this application is doing it. Are there traffic impacts? Yes. 227, the exit to 64 is right there. Those impacts are mitigated very quickly because of the proximity to that. It is not rural land. It was never envisioned to be rural land. It's meant to be economic opportunity. And this application gives us in the county the opportunity to seize on that and build on it. I appreciate the fact that the Hazelwood family has brought this property, this application forward and I would appreciate it even more if they got unanimous support from this planning commission. I think it deserves it. I appreciate your time considering it. And let's keep James City County as pretty and as great as it is now by approving this project and letting us develop this land in a way that serves everyone in the community. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have any more speaker cards, but if there's anybody else that wishes to speak on this application, please feel free to step forward. So can you come up to the, di to the dais, please? Sure. My name is Martha Ray. We live at 7440 Sturgeon Point Road in Charles City, even though our address says Providence Forge because they deliver our mail. Uh, we've been here about uh, um, 18 and a half years. Uh, my husband has uh, 
been part of a family that uh, Doc, Mr. Hazelwood, that was the father or grandfather of a lot of these people here, sold his mother and her husband two acres, or it was really 2.3 or 4 acres at that time. And so over time, uh, they found all these reasons to chip off little pieces for all these little whatever. <laughs> and so my husband was about 12 years old at that time. And so I don't think uh, your environmental study has been very efficient or very truthful um, because a lot of you people don't seem to understand how much the environment is affecting that part of the land. Um, in the two acres that uh, his family owned, um, and he's very aware of it because he played on it along, he was the oldest of six children. And so um, they played all over that property along with the property up and down the streams. There's all kinds of spontaneous streams. They had a cistern that was a free flowing um, water level or water source that came up on the two acres and they just put concrete things there to catch the water and that's all they ever drank there. They had to put in a septic tank, which they never got to use, because uh, when he was older, his uh, unconventional brother set his house on fire. <laughs> they were a very unconventional family anyway. But um, the timber on that uh, two acres is like over 60 years old, because they never cut anything down on it. And those stream that runs along the whole back edge of that has... My husband is a very outdoors person, very much so, and he says he's, he always was looking to um, start fish tanks with fish that he caught in streams and things. And he said he's seen fish in those streams that he's never seen anywhere else. He also saw salamanders in it that he's never seen anywhere else in his entire life. And those I've been with my husband for... Uh, um, about 23 years, and I've been going out to that property that whole time, and that stream is fresh, beautiful, clear water. And he said there's other streams up from it that come into it, and when you go the other way down where the stream is running, there's more streams that join into it. And so it's a, it's a drainage area, a natural, and plus more places that were coming to the surface that is uh, affecting that whole acreage in there. And I don't think people understand that. Plus, there's a lot of those places in there that the timber has never been cut. And to just think that they're going to come in there and just clear cut it and mow it all down and chip it up and sell it for paper, that just disgusts me. It really does. And so I hope you're not going to do this. Plus, we own only that little, because of your 100-foot border there. Ma'am. Yes. Can you... Direct your comments here rather yes. than... We only... Uh, well, I blame him. Uh, please, to the commissioners up here. So um, it's going to destroy the whole land. You're going to put buildings on top of it and have to put in sewage and water. That They're going to end up digging up all the places where these streams are and stuff. They'll have nowhere to go. Plus, the water table in Upper James City County has dropped so bad that people that did have shallow wells have dried up, and they had to come in and put in deep wells because they couldn't get any water because there's no city water going through there. I've known several people that I, that happened to, and they did, couldn't even flush their toilets. They had to collect rainwater, and they had to buy water in bottles and things to have water to drink and cook with. It was terrible, and so it's gonna get even worse through there. You're destroying a habitat. And there's a lot more to it than you think. A lot of the place was farmland, but there's a lot of it that's not farmland. And you're planning on destroying it by putting buildings in there that are warehouses and God knows what else. And I'm just not for that. I might be an old hippie, but I want this earth to be here in another 500,000 years. Thank you. Good evening. I uh, wasn't planning on speaking tonight, but I am a resident in the retreat, and uh, can can I ask I just you just feel with what I've heard? Can I, sir? Tonight, can I ask you to give us your name and address? I'm sorry. It's Cecil Bray, 1704 Centennial Drive, Towano, Virginia. I 
But what I've heard tonight are developers talking about all the positive things that they want to do to that little section of land up there, which I feel can't support it, it shouldn't support it, the impact that it's going to have with the traffic, the neighborhood, our water system, as you all know, uh, we're on a graduated scale, so what is that going to do to the families that live there? Also, they propose boat uh, storage, uh, other different um, businesses in there. Well, we've got businesses that they described all throughout uh, the upper end that are struggling to survive, and they're planning on putting more businesses in there. You can't keep businesses open if you don't have the employees. Everybody knows businesses are closing and having a hard time if they're not closing because they can't keep employees. There's nothing to say that what they want to do is going to uh, bring in employment. It's all projection. The people that are voting f want this are the developers, the attorneys, uh, people that have a huge financial gain in this. But the people of the upper end where we all moved for probably the same reason is to get away from Virginia Beach, Newport News. I lived in Virginia Beach, I grew up there, and I again, I saw what happened in Virginia Beach out there on the, on the far end, it's terrible. They present a, a plan that shows all these positive things, they're not gonna work. The interstate gets an accident. Route 60 is packed. And you're going to dump more people on 30 going up to Barhamsville. There are times now in Barhamsville, trying to get there is a booger because of all the traffic. And you're going to put so much more up in that area that's not going to support it. There's no guarantees financially that the businesses are going to come. We've got businesses now that are vacant. Fill those in first. Don't keep bringing stuff in on a pipe dream that looks good on paper. They talk good, everything else. They don't live up where we live. I don't know where y'all live. But we moved up in there for the peace and tranquility and the beauty of the area. I love where I live. I don't want that destroyed because developers want to come in. And I can appreciate the uh, financial end of it. God knows we all can. But there's nothing that's benefiting the people up there where we live. And I think it's truly unfair to put that type of project in that smaller area and create all the other issues the financial issues for the residents. And, you know, it's not just the water. We're on uh, septic tanks and everything else. It's going to be a disaster. And the ones that are going to suffer are going to be the local residents, while developers, they go on about the merry way. And if these businesses aren't filled, they're going to sit there vacant. And so when the whole thing collapses, Who's going to maintain that property? Uh, it's going to look like half the other places, overgrown, run down. God knows what else. So, again, I wasn't planning on speaking, but thank you. I'm very disturbed at what I see in a one-sided look at it, which makes everything smell all hunky-dory and... But look around the other developments where the bigger roads have come in. It's just the beginning. You're going to destroy that area. Hope you all have a wonderful evening and a very happy new year. Thank, Thank you, you for your time. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Stephanie Dean Ripchick. I live at 4901 Holly Fork Road in Baramisville, Virginia, 23011 New Kent County. I live about four miles from this projected uh, 
Hazelwood Enterprise Center and Village Center. You know, it's funny, I wasn't gonna speak, but the other funny thing is my daughter and I were in Gloucester and um, I know many people who were involved and had asked me to get involved and I almost didn't come. And my younger daughter who's 15 tonight said, you know what, mom, we need to go because I try to teach my children, if you don't get involved, you don't know what's happening and things pass you by and then things come into place like this. Yes, I realize that we cannot control development and things are going to happen, things are going to change. We have to be in tune to that. I completely understand that. When there is an accident on the interstate, I live on Holly Fork Road. The other end of it is called, the James City end is Holly Forks Road. My end is Holly Fork. I don't know why it's that way. That doesn't mean anything about this. But when something happens on the interstate, on our little country back road, it becomes a raceway. It is a horrid place. I can't imagine how this is going to impact us above where I kind of see the blue line there. And it is going to impact us. Again, everyone has the right to develop their land. I understand that. I also feel for the citizens and even myself, I already can hear road noise. Um, I don't think any 100-foot buffer of evergreens is enough to stop road noise, light noise, pollution, the water table, all those things are very concerning to me. I do farm. Um, it is my way of life. I very much like that way of life, but I understand development has to happen. I think we could go back to the drawing board and do it better, and I do think will impact me and my family and many that live in my area of Barhamsville, though I don't live in James City County. I'm very, very concerned, as are many folks that also couldn't be here tonight. Thank you for your time. Hey, I'm Michelle Erdley. I'm from Forge Road, 2996 Forge Road. <clears throat> um, first, I want to mention that just in case you didn't hear it right, the Save Rural James City County organization, if you will, was put together, was started only about three weeks ago, and there already are already 835 people that have joined the Facebook group, Save Rural James City County. Um, I would imagine that most of them, if not all, are against this proposal, so I think it represents well that there are a whole lot of people in the community that are very concerned about this scope of a development. We really need our rural areas, and I keep hearing from people that it is, and I've, heard, I've read it on your websites and heard from people that work here, that... Um, one of your goals in James City County is to preserve the rural areas. And I'm really not sure how having a development at, of this scope is going to do that, especially if it brings in a massive warehouse, if you will, or textile plant, such as uh, an Amazon facility, which was mentioned at least three times at one of the community meetings that I was at by Mr. Trant as one of the possibilities. So it seems like their sights are set on something like that. And that really, really concerns me and it concerns a lot of other people. And I totally agree with what Mrs. Rice said about the water impact. I'm very concerned about that as well. If you consider that there are so many people on wells in our area and they were only being counted as of the 1980s. We don't know how many people are really actually tapping water from the, the groundwater. Uh, I, anyway, I don't understand the whole thing, but it does concern me. And I hope it concerns you as well. Um, I think if we develop more of the farmland in our area, Maybe we need to do it more mindfully in, in ways that will serve the rural community. We have uh, Jamestown Feed and Seed that is closed, well, has just closed. The rural people need places like that. So why can't we 
attract businesses such as that to the area. Um, let's see. Okay, I, I made that point. <laughs> I think that's basically all I really wanted to say. So just please, at least, if you if you really feel a development is important, please at least put it off and think about it some more, so we can go back to the drawing board with the develop with the the Hazelwood family and reconsider how it might be developed. Like Linda said, it's not an economic opportunity zone. It was only proposed to be considered as one. So let's just think about this some more. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak tonight? My name is Robert Paul. I own a small piece of land on Leisure Lane. This uh, project it's not for the community. It's not for the land. It's for the Hazelwoods. They want all they can get. They're already millionaires. They've been millionaires all their lives. It's not for us. It's for them. And an example, I own a piece of land right next to there, right next to the Upper County Park. It's always been 2.3 acres of land. They send somebody out to... to Remap it. They tell me I don't have 2.3 acres of land. I've got 1.8 acres of land. I lost a half an acre to a millionaire. This is their attitude. This is the way they think. This is for them. It's not for us. I've talked to everybody in the area on the lands. Nobody there wants this there. Nobody. I've talked to them. Who wants it there? The Hazelwoods want it there. It doesn't benefit anybody else. I think we've had enough of the Hazelwoods. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak tonight? Seeing and hearing none, I'm going to close the public hearing and open it up for discussion. I guess I'll, I'll start it off. Um, first of all, I want to thank the applicant for conducting the, the three uh, community meetings that they did, as well as for uh, removing two of the uh, special use items, the truck terminal and the residential component. I, I, those were huge um, decisions on their part to do that, to make the, the plan more viable. And looking at the plan and the rezoning application. The comprehensive plan, the current one and the previous one designated their property as economic opportunity, as a potential future land use. And so I don't fault them whatsoever for putting in a proposal and the rezoning application has a number of very, very strong elements to it. And I won't go, go down the list, but there are just a, a number of safeguards um, that are included in there to, to uh, put a cap on vehicle trips, to uh, designate open spaces and other areas, uh, to put a cap on the number of 75,000 square feet of commercial and so on and so forth. It's a well thought out plan. Um, if you look at, a, at the zoning ordinance, and I'll be very brief, but just so people understand, um, any zoning district, whether it's EO or A1 or B1, has a table in there with various uses, whether it's apartments or stores or gas stations. And there's two columns. One column says permitted. That's what the terminology by right refers to. For that zoning district, if it's in the column that says permitted, the owner can do whatever they want and they don't have to come to this body or anything else. Then you've got specially permitted. Uh, that's the SUP column, and, and specially permitted uses are determined to be uses that potentially have some significant adverse impact on the community. It could fit into that zoning district, but 
a specially, uh, a specially permitted use has to go through this legislative process as well as uh, the rezoning application itself. Um, I am uh, supportive of their efforts to rezone the property, but what concerns me is the, and I mentioned this at the October meeting, and so this is, comes as no surprise, is the open-ended nature of the SUPs. Although they withdrew the two, uh, there are still eight other uh, SUP items in this application. Uh, some I support. For example, the, uh, it's an SUP to request connection to water and sewer. That I totally understand if you're going to develop the property, and it would be through the James City Service Authority. But one of the things that concerns me um, is that when you have adverse impacts, you come, uh, the applicant proposes either proffers, those are voluntary for a rezoning, or agrees to conditions that mitigate the adverse impacts. And let's just talk about traffic, for example. Um, you, saw, you heard uh, all of the traffic fixes to try to reduce the impact of it. My concern is that sometimes a corrective ap action to solve one problem creates other problems. And that's what is bothering me about this application. For example, uh, that ne relatively short section of Old Stage Road and the surrounding area could have four traffic lights. Um, it has two single lane roundabouts. If any of you have, have experienced roundabouts, whether it be at the Harris Teeter Shopping Center or over on Long Hill Road, you know that Americans are still challenged by roundabouts and, and they don't necessarily always uh, flow the traffic smoothly. Um, there's also going to be some additional uh, dedicated turn lanes. So what's happening is a, a relatively small road or a narrow road is going to be expanded significantly uh, and introducing uh, traffic mitigation measures that uh, I think could have a potentially adverse impact on the community. The other thing about the, um, the SUP request is the open-ended nature. For example, uh, one of the statements is any, emphasis on any, commercial building or group of buildings that exceed 10,000 square feet. Another part of the SUP application is any building or group of buildings that generate 100 or more additional peak hour vehicle trips per day. And um, the term any uh, bothers me quite a bit. One of the, the previous speakers said, um, do we have to rush into this and, and, and approve all these uh, requests right now, or, or do we take some time? And that's why I'm leaning towards uh, the desire to say, yes, let's, you know, I could support the master plan and I can support the rezoning application, but I don't like the open-ended nature uh, of the SUP requests. I think that there's nothing wrong with putting a package together and putting it out there and when you would, when you, um, the marketplace attracts a user, if it's not a buy right use, then you can go through the process and um, uh, have the Board of Supervisors ultimately approve it. Because let's face it, if, you know, the applicant has also said that this is not going to take place overnight. It could be years, and several years down the road, a use that might be envisioned today would be not economically viable, and so there'd be a totally different use. And so rather than have the open-ended uh, component that says any uh, group of buildings over X number of square feet, I, I would feel much better uh, not just, just saying in general terms, but have specific uses for those uh, buildings in mind. Um, I also said in October that this application is going to forever change Upper James City County, and I know change is coming. Um, I'm personally disappointed that, that the county couldn't uh, aggressively pursue um, rural economic development. Back in 2014, there was a, a rural economic study that, that came up with 13 different uses for rural lands that could be economically viable, whether they be food hubs or community kitchens or whatever. The report's still very applicable to today, um, and, and I was optimistic at that time that that would open up some development opportunities on parcels like the one that we're seeing today, but apparently uh, there's no interest in that. But um, 
I, do th I, I am concerned about the open-ended nature of it. I, I certainly understand the applicant uh, saying, listen, you gave us a comp plan. This parcel meets all the criteria for economic opportunity, and it does. It's very strategic to the interstate, and it meets all these other requirements, but uh, to me, the, the potential traffic impact and, and the change to the uh, character of the upper community or upper county as well as the um, uh, open-ended nature of the, U of the SUP uses um, make it uh, make me not able to support as it is uh, written tonight. Mr. Polster? As you all know, for almost a year and a half, two years, we went through the count plan process. And in that process, one of the things that we had to deal with was this notion of how to protect and preserve the rural character and the environment. It was one of the things that were really at the top of our list a lot of time. We also had a charter to relook at the uh, PSA, primary service area, which is where the county says it wants development versus the rural. And, and in one case, for the portion of the stone house, it uh, was removed from the PSA so that it wouldn't have that development and would remain rural. The Hazelwood property and the Taylor property were placed into the PSA and placed in economic development because the county said, we want development in these areas. And so to say that the Hazelwood properties are in the rural side of the county is a misnomer. I mean, it, it's not. And, and as to the change uh, that's going to occur, when the county approved the Stonehouse development, it changed the upper county. And so one of the things that we struggled with in the comp plan was this idea that by 2045, we were going to have a population of 120,000. When I came here in 87, it was about 43, and it's now 78. And so the idea that the growth is going to happen, that growth is projected in the upper county. Now, one of the things that we argued about in the comp plan was residential development. And there were some of us that wanted more residential development, mixed use along the Anderson Corner. And there's some of us that said no. When this application came up and they proposed the residential piece, there were a lot of us that were against it again. And so why do I bring that up? Is the Stonehouse project has approved tracks S, 11A, and 5, of which they will add 1,155 condominiums or new homes. And what that did was it triggered the proffer for a signal at the Fieldstone and at the um, Wood Grange piece for it. And so the, one of the things that I, I really take my hat off is when the traffic study was done and the impacts were done on this thing. It wasn't done in isolation. And what's more, one of the things that was pointed out to me is when you end up with those four signals on that road, you end up bringing down, because of the synchronization, and any of you that have driven on Monticello Road know what I'm talking about, is the traffic lights are synchronized to just the speed. And so that 55 mile an hour either way, that people are plunging off the interstate to go up barns or coming back down, is going to be stopped to about 23 miles, if I remember the figures correctly. And so hopefully we will never see an accident of somebody going 55 miles because there's going to be at least two stoplights in between to stop that. Or if you're trying to make a left-hand turn. And so the other beauty of what that did is it did put a cap and it settled out in my mind the open-endedness. Now the open-endedness goes this way. You heard uh, the question on the tax-free zone and what does that really mean? And in fact, we have businesses in the Stonehouse business that fall in anything. The Latende folks bring in food from Portugal, process it, and out they go. Uh, the East Coast 
for coffee processing, Norfolk is the third largest in the entire East Coast because it reprocesses coffee. The idea that this property, now if the zoning gets approved with these SUPs, and a requirement for this SUP that they've asked for is to bring sewer and water, will move this project from a three to a five on the governor's book. That's the highest you can get. And so for the first time, we're going to have a project that is going to have the support of the Virginia government to be able to market this thing the way it should be. And this master plan allows for that type of development to take place that we've been talking about for this tax-free zone. Now, one of the dilemmas that we went through within the comp plan as we looked at the issues of whether it should be mixed use or should stay this way was the implication of the zoning, which we've talked about. But the fact of the matter is the property is in the PSA and it's zoned. And so now we have the owner's rights versus the public good, which is what a lot of what we're hearing today. And, and there's no doubt in my mind that this is going to impact that character. But on the other hand, as somebody pointed out, is that when Anheuser Bush came in here, Bush came in, the tax rate paid for schools and a bunch of other things. This county right now is dependent on residential tax. And if we don't bring in industries like this in localities that are meant to be that way, we're going to see tax increases. I mean, it's as simple as that for it. So th there, there are a lot of reasons that, that I think that this uh, project is worthy of my support, and I intend to. Okay. Um, since I represent the Stonehouse District, I'm going to make a lot of people, I guess, unhappy, but whatever. Um, I've looked into this extensively. First of all, the property is not zoned rural. It's outside of the PSA area, and it is not zoned rural land. It was zoned B1, what, 20 years ago? You, somebody might remember that. So by right, the Hazelwoods can do just about anything they want to do, as Mr. Tramp put out. Under a master plan, they are confined by so many things that we have in our master, in our comprehensive plan, and so many rules we have on the books that they're just not going to be able to go out there and put up a warehouse. It's going to go through the whole process. Otherwise, you have a property, 300 acres or whatever. You can put residential out there. Residential never, ever pays for all the things you get. Doesn't pay for schools. Doesn't pay for any infrastructure. Residential is a drain on, this, on the area. So I've been looking into this. Um, I don't, you know, you have to really think about what, what you want. Do you want to look at little houses and a little food market and a car repair shop? I don't know. Or do you want some industry to come in here and pay and keep the taxes lower and pay for new schools, which some people say they want, but I don't think it's going to happen up there. Um, you put houses up there, that these uh, road improvements are not going to happen. All those road houses will come down Barnes Road, which I think is a very dangerous road to begin with. Going to be on water and sewer, because that's what the county has said. We're going to get revenue from taxes. These planned communities are very beautiful. I live in one of them. I think Stonehouse is gorgeous. The county is very, very restrictive on what can happen. So I think you're going to see something that looks really nice. I think the, the driving is going to be fixed. To, you know, it wasn't before Stonehouse just has to put in two lights now, and then we're going to have two more, which will slow people down. I think it's a good thing for the community, and I'm going to vote yes. Dr. Rose? Uh, thank you, and, and thank you all for coming out and speaking so passionately about this topic it's really useful to hear from everybody and on one hand I, I i recognize what you're saying that the fact that there is a master plan gives us the devil that we know rather than the devil that we don't know if 
they develop it by right. And that's, that's a bit of a concern, but where my challenge is, is I think about these places as plots of land bounded by uh, red lines and blue lines as we see on the map. And certainly the development of this location seems to make sense in terms of its proximity to 64, uh, the access that gives it. But I'm, I'm also trying to look beyond those red and blue boundaries to understand the impact of a development like this, a development on the scale of this, uh, which is a huge scale. And I think about, uh, you mentioned the tax base and the promise of more taxes coming in. And I often think about the stadiums that get built in cities and they always promise the employment and the taxes that are going to be generated by these stadiums and they never they they never deliver on the promises that they make and on the other side of all this I'm worried about that that there's this opportunity that we see for development and uh, increased taxes but like Mr. Croft said we have no idea what it's going to look like we don't understand what this massive development is going to be and it's it's a real challenge to try to approve something that's so unknown on this scale. Um, and I do want to think about what happens beyond the boundaries of this development and, and the impact that it has not only on the communities, but on uh, the other businesses in the area, depending on what potentially comes in or doesn't come in. Uh, without knowing that, it's me, it, it does seem hard to s sort of support a development of this scale that is so unknown in terms of what it's actually going to be. Thank you. Ms. Leverance? Yes, um, I don't have a lot to add. I, I can say personally that it is a beautiful piece of property. And I think if I lived across the street and were not on the Planning Commission, I would be screaming bloody murder because it's a beautiful piece of property. Um, that said, my job as a planning commissioner is to look at where this fits in the county's long range plan. And that long range plan is the, is the comprehensive plan. And yes, it fits. I'm not as concerned about the open endedness, possibly because things are changing so fast partly in response to the pandemic and people working from home and, and the increase in automation. I think it's very possible that five years from now, the face of American industry is going to be very, very different. And it's also possible that the developer would come back and say, well, look at what's going on now. And here's what we have in mind, fully automated warehouses with no traffic, no employment, and only in, only bringing in property taxes. Um, I'm inclined to support this because of that. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Leverance. Um, I, I, I typically find myself in the minority position and um, you know, I do appreciate everybody's comments and, and I think those who, who are part of the comp plan um, and, and struggled through this with, along with staff and the rest of the planning commissioners would, would understand that, um, you know, these are, these are never easy discussions. Um, there were a lot of uh, um, uh, less than pleasant conversations, if we will, um, in, in some of the comp plan discussions that we had. Um, because we, we, do, we do recognize how hard it is to strike a balance between what the long character of James City County has been. And, you know, when we talk about what the residents told us um, in this last comp plan was, yes, preserve the rural character of the county, you know, with rural lands defined as being outside of the PSA. You know, what they also told us was, we'll accept if you protect those rural lands outside the PSA, we'll accept higher density development and development inside the PSA. So, um, and we also went along with this whole concept of what's a complete community. And, uh, you know, I say I'm in the minority position because I was the only person who actually supported having a residential component to this piece um, in our last discussion. 
because to Dr. Rose's point, you know, if we have a residential component inside an area like this, to me, it serves as a, a great transition piece, as Mr. Lampett described. Um, but it also gives us an opportunity to have affordable workforce housing inside um, a larger compound so people can walk and bike to work, right? The, the trend in, in development now is, is to have a lot of these campus-style facilities where people can live, work, and play, you know, because so much of this is now pandemic-driven where people are, are working um, remotely, um, you know, and they have the opportunity to, to go to an office once or twice a week, and that really allows things to, to change. So um, to the comment to, that was made earlier, too, about the Hunt Farm and, and the solar farm, I suspect that if somebody came in and said, we're going to clear all this land and put in a solar farm, we would hear bloody murder as well. Uh, you know, we see that up in the Fredericksburg area with the, the largest solar farm in Virginia. And I think what we're seeing here is um, really an opportunity to meet a lot of, the th a lot of those other requirements of the comp plan which was jobs, which was put the density in resident in the PSA. You know, we don't want to be overpopulated with the residential piece. So the Hazelwoods made that concession and pulled that out. I understand that they put it in just because that's what, what the ordinance stated, and they made that adjustment based on, on the feedback that they got at the last meeting. You know, I don't anticipate that putting a pause on this will continue to create any more changes. I think that they're, I, I think it was done with good intent and they pulled out some of the uses that were most concerning to folks. Um, so again, I made the comment at our last meeting, if we don't do it here, where do we do it? You know, are we gonna go put it in at Anderson's Corner? So I suspect that if we put in a project like this at, at uh, this intersection with 64, it will not allow the development of Anderson's Corner to the same scale just because, you know, there won't be that much need uh, as there was. So um, I intend to support this because uh, I do think it's in keeping with the comp plan, so. But, but just to follow up, it, it's not a binary decision in that we put this development here, we put it somewhere else. As Mr. Croft mentioned, there's a lot of different ways to develop rural lands that improve the economics, and they don't all mean industrial areas. And so I don't agree with him that it, it's unfortunate that we're not looking at other opportunities. And it's it seems like we're having to make a decision of, well, this goes here, or it goes somewhere else. And I don't think that's a decision we're making. Do you remember we approved the uh, the village center across the street, which is going to have probably a hotel, a grocery store, restaurant, yes, I guess a couple other things. So that that's different than what this is across the street. But they'll be across the street from each other. Right, but no, one I, is more for the residents than the industrial, of course. Right, right. And and again, we have the promise of jobs. We don't have jobs. That, as you mentioned, that could change in five years where everything's fully automated. There's no jobs there. I, I just, I, I think we're hanging our hat on a, a great unknown here. But they're going to, well, according to Mr. Trent, they will develop according to um, people coming in there. You come in with your business, and then I come in, and then maybe a couple years down the road, somebody else comes in. So it's not going to be a build, and they'll come. It's going to be to build as they come, which is a difference. But my, my concern about the open-endedness was just to say uh, any building over 10,000 square feet, if you don't know what's going in that building, how can you gauge what the impacts are on the community or on the, um, the traffic flows mm -hmm. or, or whatever? And that's one of the reasons I asked my hypothetical question earlier was are these vehicle trip caps absolute no they're not um it's like anything nothing very few things are absolutes but that was my you know to address 
sort of Dr. Rose's is comment, that was my concern was that by not knowing, by, by just saying, yes, I'm good with any, any group of buildings, you can have any use in those versus um, saying, well, no, let's ask the applicant to come and say, we have a, a client who wants to put this use in here. Um, it requires an SUP and go through the legislative process. It's, it's more costly to certainly go through for an SUP. I think it costs today $1,200 at least, not counting whatever experts you bring in. But I'm looking at the, 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 the total economic scale of this project. And, and to me, it's, it's worth saying, no, you're going to, I'd prefer you move forward in incremental steps rather than have everything in, in the one bucket right now. Mr. Krupp, yes, uh, are you talking about staging this? Uh, we talked about that a little bit at the, at the December meeting. I guess, in a sense, uh, what I'm, what I, I think, what I'm would be more comfortable with is having a rezoning package with a conceptual master plan designating land bays and and so on, and and act, and and specifying certain, you know, certainly by right uses that could go in there. I mean. Um, if you had a conceptual plan with the, the, the land masses designated, um, the understanding is there, there's a number of businesses or, or activities that could go in there by right, but then those that are a little bit more intrusive or have more adverse impacts that fall under the SUP category, well, let's, let's go forward and say, let's look at this one separately. And, you know, does that fit with all of the criteria that, the, the comp plan and the zoning and so on and so forth. But that's, I guess that's what I'm sort of what I'm, I'm falling back on is saying I, I don't like the, the word any building or group of buildings over 10,000 square feet, any building or group of commercial or, or otherwise that d does this. I, I feel more comfortable because this is going to irre irrevocably change the upper county. I feel much more comfortable saying, yes, let's look at a rezoning and a conceptual master plan and allow whatever can go in by right, but SUP items, they need to be treated a little differently. I'm even, in, uh, I'm fine with an SUP condition in a rezoning that would, that calls for or allowing connection to James City Service Water and Sewer because I, I realize that that's, that's needed in order to develop that. I mean, my, my wish list would be that that Rural Economic Development Committee report uh, had been implemented and there had been an aggressive uh, recruiting opportunity on, on the part of James City County to bring in uh, any of those 13 businesses and, and, and try to create a new, new vision uh, up at that end of the county. As a matter of fact, the vision, the study vision said something like uh, the, the study vision is to develop uh, rural economic generators that will become an integral part of the economy of James City County and, and that's obviously not been happening but sorry to ramble on I just wanted to, to clarify a bit that I'm I'm three-quarters of the way with them on the application but the open-endedness still bothers me oh, I I read the the report that you sent over um, it'd been a while since I, I last read it but I was somewhat um, surprised to to be reminded that you know the the how little agriculture actually brings into the local economy you know and for those those who who lease their farms you know that that revenue is going to to the farmers who are leasing it and it's getting reported in and taxed in other places so it's it's really not um you know the farming uses are really not the huge benefit to the county as as you know we might believe so yeah that's why they they, that report came up with other uses, whether, right. yeah, but you're right. Mr. Polster? I'd like to make a uh, motion on the rezoning of 19006 and the SUP condition 19005 and recommend that the Planning Commission recommend approval to the Board of Supervisors uh, for the conditions and acceptance of the voluntary the proffers and the acceptance of the proffers.
Dr. Holt, we have a motion. Ms. Knoll. Aye. Mr. Rose. No. Mr. Polster. Aye. Ms. Leverens. Aye. Mr. Crop. No. And Mr. O'Connor. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Chairman, can we take a break? Yeah, I was going <laughs> to offer that. So um, it's okay. a, shortly after okay. nine, so we'll recess for five minutes.
So we are now reconvened. So our next item tonight is zoning case 21-0015, 6940 and 6950, Richmond Road proffer amendment. Good evening, Mr. Leinecker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. Mr. Doug Harbin has applied to amend the existing proffers for two parcels located at 6940 Richmond Road and 6950 Richmond Road. The proffer amendment is to revise the timing of the required signal warrant study. The properties are zoned B1 with proffers located within the primary service area and are designated mixed use on the 2045 comprehensive plan land use map. The current proffers were adopted on August 31st, 2006 and required that the traffic signal to be bonded prior to the first building permit of the properties. Currently, the signal warrant study would be required within six months of the full buildout of the two properties or earlier if requested by VDOT. Harbin Properties LLC has maintained a letter of credit in accordance with the 2006 proffers since the Colonial Car Wash property was developed at 6950 Richmond Road in 2009. <clears throat> the second property currently is undeveloped. The proposed proffer would eliminate the need to renew the surety each year, and it would require a traffic signal warrant study to be conducted prior to any final site plan approval for the vacant property at 6940 Richmond Road. If the signal is warranted at that time, it would then be required to be installed prior to any occupancy permit according to the proposed proffer. Staff finds this proffer amendment to be compatible with the surrounding development and consistent with the 2045 comprehensive plan and zoning ordinance. Staff recommends the planning commission to recommend approval of this application of this proffer amendment to the Board of Supervisors. I'll be happy to answer any questions and the applicants here as well. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Leinegro? I don't know what's going in there. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, there's That's no across current. the street from where I live. What is going in there? There's nothing. <laughs> there's no current proposed use at okay. this time. Yep. This time I would like to open the public hearing. Mr. Getty. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, it's my pleasure to be here representing Harbin Properties. Doug Harbin's also here. Um, I'll be so brief. This, I think, does two good things. It continues to ensure that the signal warrant analysis will be done when needed, and if needed, the light will be installed. But it also relieves Harbin Properties of the burden of the last 15 years or so of keeping this letter of credit outstanding. So with that, I'd be urge you to recommend approval and glad to answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. Getty or Mr. Harbin? Ms. Leverins, any questions? No, thank you. Thank you very much. Very much. Mr. Harbin, I don't have any speaker cards tonight, so I will close the public hearing. So, and look for discussion or a motion. Mr. Polster? I make a motion that we approve, I recommend to the board, the approval of JC Zone 21-0015-6940 Richmond uh, and 6950 Richmond Road proffer amendment uh, with the uh, approval of the application acceptance of the amended proffers to the Board of Supervisors. Mr. Holt, we have a motion. Ms. Null. Aye. Mr. Rose. Aye. Mr. Polster. Aye. Ms. Leverins. Aye. Mr. Krupp. Aye. And Mr. O'Connor. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, our last case this evening is SUP 21-0017, 4007, Ironbound Road, convenience store with fuel. Mr. Leininger, welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. Mr. Mark Rinaldi of Bush Construction, Corp Bush Construction Corporation has applied for a special use permit for a convenience store with fuel sales at a property located at 4007 Ironbound Road. Property is zoned B1 with proffers, designated mixed use on the 2045 comprehensive plan land use map, and located inside the primary service area. <clears throat> a convenience store which sells and dispenses fuel is a specially permitted use in the B1 zoning district. Additionally, any convenience store and uses that generally over 100 peak hour trips 
require a commercial SUP. In 2018, the property, along with adjacent VDOT cul-de-sac and a portion of the 4002 Ironbound Road, were rezoned to B1 with proffers. That rezoning also included design guidelines adopted by the Board of Supervisors. Uh, a traffic impact analysis was completed for this uh, convenience store with fuel proposal, which recommends the installation of a second exclusive left turn lane on northbound Ironbound Road, heading towards the intersection with Monticello Avenue and Ironbound Road. Uh, additionally, a right turn taper and a right turn lane are recommended for southbound Ironbound Road uh, at the intersection of Ironbound Road, Courthouse Commons, and Old Ironbound Road. The TIA also recommends pavement markings and modifications to the traffic signal at the intersection with Monticello Avenue. All recommended improvements shall be installed before the first certificate of occupancy of the convenience store per the uh, proposed conditions. On October 28, 2021, the Newtown Design Re Review Board reviewed the master plan and the building elevations and approved the design in its conceptual form. Prior to site plan approval, the Newtown DRB would review the design elements again for consistency with the adopted design guidelines. Staff finds this proposal to be compatible with the surrounding development and consistent with the 2045 comprehensive plan and zoning ordinance. Staff recommends the planning commission to recommend approval of this application to the Board of Supervisors subject to the proposed conditions. And the applicants are here as well to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions? No, I spoke to Mr. Getty. I didn't know if he need, wanted to know. So I'll get to that in a second. I was just, it, does anybody have questions for Mr. Leinecker? So, thank you. So uh, before we open up the public hearing, just ask if there's any disclosures. Obviously, Ms. Knowles spoke to Mr. Getty. I did as well. Anybody else? I talked to Mr. Getty also. I see. So, um, I had a conversation with Mr. Getty and with Mr. Rinaldi um, at Harris Teeter over the weekend. So, um, with that. So, um, the, for then, I will open the public hearing. And Mr. Getty. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, uh, I remain Vernon Getty. It's great to see you again. Um, it's my pleasure to be here representing the applicant and Bush Construction Corporation and its affiliate BCC at Water Tower LLC. Um, we have a host of folks here, Mark Rinaldi with Bush Construction, uh, Jeb Bell with Wawa, and a number of other familiar faces, Jason Grimes with AES, John Hopke with Hopke and Associates, and Dexter Williams with DRW and Associates. So you'll recall, that while this is a small infill site, it not actually in Newtown, but directly across the street, it was one of the first properties owned in this area back in 2002 um, for a five-story office building. And that was a project that proved not to be financially feasible, and the parcel has sat vacant since then. This is the old master plan from then. You'll see the building is tucked right up in the corner of uh, Monticello and um, Ironbound beside the water tanks, and there's actually a right-in entrance directly off um, Ironbound right at the intersection into the property. Um, Tom mentioned through the efforts of basically Mark Rinaldi, the property owner, G Square, has purchased um, this middle piece from VDOT. It's been abandoned as right away, and that purchase has been complete. And you will recall the relationships here. G Square actually owns the land. The Bush affiliate leases it under a long-term land lease. And uh, if this is successful, Wawa would sublease the property. Um, this is the church property that was in that rezoning and where Bush will build an overflow parking lot for the church. Um, the rezoning in, granted in 2019 permitted various commercial and office uses on the parcel. It restricted other uses and did provide for the overflow parking for the Mount Pleasant Baptist Church. And there were proffers, a binding master plan, and a set of design guidelines prepared by Mr. Hopke. 
Um, this is that master plan. It showed buffers and potential entrance points and the like. So the applicant now has the opportunity to locate a Wawa on this property and has applied for a special use for that. It would be just over a 6,000 square foot building uh, and you will see, you've seen in the elevations, it has 360 degree architectural treatments and multiple unique features in accordance with the design guidelines um, that would differentiate it from a standard store you might see along the interstate somewhere would have six fueling islands. Um, importantly and currently, there is no convenience store fuel sales east of Route 199 on the new town side of Route 199. This is a much needed use. Um, this is the master plan for the site, and I know this is busy and hard to see. This may be a little clearer. Um, this would be the building right here. Uh, the fueling stations, dumpster enclosures here. You'll see there's a pedestrian feature here and sidewalk that comes directly down to the building here. Um, there's also a sidewalk on the old ironbound roadside that would extend all the way to the church property with another pedestrian connection here. Uh, see parking has been pulled back. We've worked extensively with JCSA on this and pull back from their property and their spots are right here. Um, knew this, but staff made very clear up front that traffic impacts were the most um, significant consideration in this application. Um, the applicant and Dexter Williams began working with staff, VDOT, and the county's um, traffic consultant, Kimley Horn, back in March. Um, first to decide, define the scope and methodology for the traffic study. And then during these last 10 months, um, Mr. Williams is engaged in a really thorough and comprehensive study analysis and traffic modeling um, to arrive at the approved traffic impact analysis and the list of triggered improvements. Um, Recognizing the significance of the traffic issues here, the applicant agreed to use a new and very conservative trip generation projection methodology here, resulting in projected trip generations that are significantly higher than those you would have seen in any prior application for this type of use. Uh, it, so what you are seeing is truly a very conservative, worst-case traffic scenario. With that and with the improvements, you will see this is a summary of some of the key things, key conclusions in the traffic study. Um, right now, that at Monticello Avenue and Route 199, level of service C's with Wawa, a and P, and it's actually a B and a C. Um, at Monticello and Ironbound, there's a B and a C. It remains at C um, with this. Um, and as you know, what level of service is, is a measure of delay at intersections. And looking at those figures, at Monticello Avenue and Route 199, um, there is a change in the delay with the Wawa of 1.7 seconds. Um, at Monticello and Ironbound, it's 4.4 seconds. And at the old Ironbound and Ironbound, where there are truly no traffic issues, it's 2.7 seconds. If you compare the Wawa, not with the no-build scenario, but with what would be permitted by right under the existing zoning, the changes in the delays are less than one in two seconds. So the improvements that get you to that point on the <coughs> west side of Ironbound here outlined in green, there would be a 100-foot right turn lane with a 100-foot taper. So people making this movement have a right turn lane to come into old Ironbound. On the other side of the road, on the east side, um, Beginning way back off this slide, there is widening that would be done, but the, the key improvement is the addition of another lane right along here. So there would be three lanes 
approaching this intersection, the far right lane would be a dedicated through right lane, and then the other two lanes are dedicated left turn lanes. And with those improvements, there would be signal adjustments at the intersection and restriping and the like done. Staff, VDOT, and Kimwe Horn, after really an exhaustive traffic study, you all have seen it's 286 pages long. And it, I mean, this has been studied like none of the big plan communities in the area, I think. It's, it, it, it's really been looked at quite closely. Um, and the conclusion is that the level of services is maintained at acceptable levels across the area road network. With the required roadway and signal improvements, the delays that we just went over are nearly imperceptible. I mean, by the time I finish this sentence, that's how the additional delay you would experience at one of these intersections. And it's particularly true compared to the by right development scenario. One thing I think is significant with a use like Wawa is the capture rate. It, it, this is a use that captures vehicles that are already on the road. And with this use, 65 to 75 percent of the cars coming and leaving Wawa are people who are already on the road system. So the, that's the bypass traffic. It's a very low number of primary trips that people get in their car and say, I'm going to drive to Wawa and back home. So it, I think that is significant. And it, that, to me, plays into the next point. Where this is a site that allows residents or customers in Newtown or Sutler's Market to access convenience and fuel by not driving along Monticello but crossing Monticello from Newtown, from Casey on to old, onto Ironbound Road and keeps him off Monticello. And it keeps him off the more congested segment of Monticello west of Route 199 where the only gas with convenience store is located. Um, if you know down off, you take a left on Ironbound and it's up that way. Here are the elevations of the building. This is the side that would face Monticello. Um, you'll see the windows and awnings and the like, architectural features on all four sides. This faces this old ironbound. This is the canopy. It's frankly more interesting than a typical squared off canopy and no signage on it. And these are the dumpster enclosures. And as uh, Tom mentioned, um, these elevations have been reviewed and approved by staff and the Mon uh, Newtown Design Review Board. Um, so to sum up, we agree with the staff report, obviously. Uh, we think this is a great use in this location. I think it's good planning to have this use in this location. Uh, the proposal is consistent with the comprehensive plan. It's consistent with surrounding development and the proffered master plan and design guidelines. It's been approved by the Newtown Design Review Board and, of course, staff and that board would have one more crack at it when final plans come in. The traffic impacts have been studied exhaustively and the improvements required by the SUP conditions mitigate traffic impacts. Provides a needed use in this location on the east side of Route 199 to serve the residents and customers of Newtown. It will generate significant tax dollars for James City County, and it will also allow the first thing to be built would be the overflow parking for the church since they've, they are now parking in that cul-de-sac that will be removed. So that would happen first. So with that, we would be glad to answer any questions, but would urge you to recommend approval to the Board of Supervisors. Any questions for Mr. Getty? I had one quick question. I can't find it, but I thought I saw electrical charging stations at one point on one of the di diagrams. Am I yeah. incorrect about that? I think there will it's be the those in the future. I don't know if they're on the current plan. Mm -hmm. yeah. No? We did, were they? I thought I saw them, yeah, too. I thought I saw them, too. But is okay. There, just to follow there up are future on that. plans for electrical charging stations. Yeah, come on, Jeff. Good evening. I'm Jeb Bell with Wawa. Um, the electrical charging stations aren't constructed by Wawa. They're constructed by a partner. So what we do is we show it on plan so we can identify an area where they would make sense. Okay. Right? So they're feasible okay. in the future. But they're 
they would need to be, um, Tesla or another partner would want, need to be interested in this location. They generally are. So this location does have a space potentially for electric cars. Correct. Okay, okay yep. so I thought, see, yeah. see we didn't lose our minds. Okay, okay. You did okay. see it on there. Yeah. Is there going to be um, plants and all that kind of stuff along Monticello to yes. kind of? Yes, there we okay. um, I didn't see those. Did I see those on the plan? Sean Faulkner doesn't say indicate what I've done. Landscaping. Yeah, just, it just says buffer. Yeah, this, oh, there they are. This okay. shows just the most conceptual, yeah, I didn't but okay. there is a condition that requires enhanced landscaping, right, right. and it would be along all of these buffers. Right, okay. Good. Mr. Getty, just to confirm, when you described the lanes, you said there were two dedicated left turn lanes, one dedicated right turn lane. I think I see it here, but presumably there's one lane you can go straight. Yeah, right? there's a, okay. it's a right one goes through. One straight or right. Two of yeah, them. Yeah, exactly. Right. One straight or right, two left. Okay, we're not going to lose the ability to no. get your car. Right? No, that's right. And, and just to confirm, there is going to be overflow parking for the church that's going to yes, be developed, so they don't fact, lose that. That will be the first parking. thing built, is this parking right here. Ms. Leverins, any questions? No questions, thank you. So, Mr. Kropp, anything? So. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Getty. So, anybody else wish to speak on this application? My name's Ken Freeman. I'm a resident of James City County. Uh, live at 10 Sussex Road. More importantly, the slide you had up there, our family owns Ironbound Mini Storage. So <clears throat> Mark was very gracious and came to us with this proposal to give us the heads up. Wanted to know our concerns because we use that part of the road more than the church. And he has worked with us consistently, keeping us involved. And we're happy uh, to have them as a neighbor. And what's real important to me, I was in the office the other day in Richmond. And I was looking on the wall. And we have aerial photographs. And in 2000, when uh, we built this job, there was nothing there. And today, there's still nothing there. And I listened to y'all a little bit earlier, and you were talking about taxes and businesses and taxes. I can't think of anything that's going to create more tax dollars for the county than a gas station. So we, uh, the family, with Ironbound Road Mini Storage, we're good. We like it. We think it's a good use of the property, and we support it. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak? Bernie? At the risk of double dipping, one point I did want to make is stormwater management on the site. Um, you're probably aware there's existing water that drains from the Walmart side that comes through this site at present. And then there's the drainage that will come from this site. And under the conditions, this, there will be stormwater management requirements that you would not get with a buy right development. And one of those is retaining a 100-year storm from both sources on this property. And I know that was important to, to this gentleman. He's got a pipe that runs under his um, pro project, and this would mitigate flooding concerns there. Um, and it also uh, additional water quality requirements on this site by not allowing them to meet those requirements by purchasing nutrient credits from a bank. So you'll you'll get enhanced stormwater management on this site as well. So thanks. I promise I won't come back. <laughs> Actually, Mr. Getty, I'm sorry. I did have one question, and I don't know if it's um, Wawa or Mr. Hopke, but what's the what's the lighting going to be like on this? I would, yeah, but then the lights are limited to 20 feet, and they're... Yeah, so uh, thanks for the question. Everything's LED, so it's very directional. We'll do a photometric plan, and there's all kinds of requirements, but they're very, um, we can tune them very specifically, so there's no light over our lease line and things like that, so.
Yeah, I just, uh, I've been to this site probably five times in the last week or so, and three of them at night just to see things. And, you know, it is it is pretty, um, just, just overall the whole lighting plan is pretty subdued in the whole area. So I just, you know, knowing this is going to be 24-7, just to have that, you know, not spill over um, would be. That's a requirement that it not spill over. Great, thanks. Anybody else wish to speak? Yes, no. So, so seeing and hearing none, I will close the public hearing and turn it over for discussion. Mr. Polster? I, I can't resist this one. Is I was concerned about the stormwater also. <laughs> and yes, they attenuate the water coming off of Monticello, and they attenuate the water on their own site but not the water coming off of the JCSA. And so my concern wasn't so much about that 42 inch pipe, but how all of that water is gonna pass underneath his facility and into the stormwater pond on the other side of your property. Oh no, that was the question. So the answer from the stormwater guys is that they'll come back and revisit that if there is an impact onto that uh, stormwater facility that's in the back of his uh, storage facility. And that was really my concern because that area is actually the responsibility of the county for its MS4 permit. And so I know that we have a vested interest of making sure that the water quality is there because of how it flows into the Mill Creek uh, watershed. Having said that, one of the things about this SUP uh, that wasn't brought up was that we're being asked to um, uh, approve a traffic above 99 trips, right? And so the answer, the question was for uh, Mr. Williams is what's the answer? How, how many more? And if I remember correctly for the PM peak area, it was going to be 118. So we're, we're talking about doing 18 over what he could do by right. Uh, and on top of it, they put all the traffic pieces in place in terms of coming off of old ironbound, both left and right. W one of the things that, that bothers me, uh, uh, bothered me about this, but isn't true, is when we look at the Monticello shopping across from Windsor Mead earlier last year or so, uh, there's no way that the traffic on that is going to be attenuated over, over a period of time. And so the fact that it's the new trips that are going to be on Monticello that was accounted for, plus what was coming out, uh, made a difference for me. Plus, there was no right-hand turn off of Monticello directly into the facility, which would have just been it. That would have said no to me. So the, the design and the entry that you have around the JCSA <coughs> tower and that exit, my God, we're not going to have the problem that you have with your Wawa on Richmond Road and Lightfoot, which Lightfoot. is just a mess because of that in it. So I thank you for the design on the old iron side for that, and I intend to uh, support the project. Mr. Krupp? Um, from a, just a personal aesthetics standpoint, and I, I was probably looking at that uh, as a model, that Wawa on right. uh, Lightfoot Road, but um, the idea of a 5,000 square foot uh, Wawa with six fueling stations going into that site uh, was something that really didn't, appeal to me, to be honest with you. I much would have preferred to see uh, professional offices or something similar go in there. It, it, to me, it just sort of adds to uh, a more glaring commercialization of an area that's already commercialized. But at, at any rate, um, the applicant put together, uh, you know, my, my aesthetics aside, the applicant put together a, a good design. It's consistent with the comprehensive plan in that it's an infill development that um, is one of the major goals that, that we've set forth. Um, it the applicants agreed to abide by the new town uh, design guidelines, and, and there are design guidelines in their own right for this. So I'll, I'll also su support it somewhat reluctantly, but I'll support it. Dr. Rose, Ms. Noll. So, Ms. Leverance, any comments? Oh, I think this is a good package. Um, I, I think it's something that is needed in the area. Uh, it could be a drugstore. It could be a lot of other things that would be uh, probably perhaps not quite as 
objectionable as Mr. Kropp said in, in terms of, of aesthetics, but um, traffic generation could be could be just as bad. So I think it's a good proposal for a good area and I like the infill aspect of it. And I really appreciate the way the applicant has coordinated with the neighbors. Thank you, Ms. Leverance. Um, you know, I'll just add, I appreciate the traffic impacts. Um, obviously, the improvements are, are going above and beyond. Um, I, I know Mr. Getty referred to this as, as capturing a lot of traffic already there, but in essence, it's almost a destination um, by the way it's set up. So without that right turn off of Monticello and, and having the ability, you know, for folks to go in old ironbound, um, you know, I think it takes the in and out congestion that we typically see and puts it in a place that is a benefit to everybody. Um, I appreciate you, the comments um, from the adjacent property owners in the church in support of this. So, um, you know, and, and it was interesting to me the other night, just um, it was Sunday night and it was dead. There was no traffic in that area. Um, and as you as you come in there, it's actually the elevation's a little bit lower than than Monticello. So, you know, the, the visual impacts are actually much less because you're looking more down on the site than actually having having it at, at street level. So I intend to support it. So so on that I'll look for a motion. Make a motion that the Planning Commission uh, recommend approval of SUP 21-0017-407 Ironbound Road, mm -hmm. SUP for Wawa Convenience Store and Gas Station, and the acceptance of the amended proffers to the Board of Supervisors. Well, we have a motion. Call the roll, please. Ms. Null. Aye. Mr. Rose. Aye. Mr. Polster. Aye. Ms. Leverance. Aye. Mr. Kropp. Aye. And Mr. O'Connor. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Yeah, with conditions, not proffers, just to kind of clarify the motion, because this is just an SUP. And Tom, I would like to say thanks for those maps you sent over today. I thought yeah. Yeah, that was, that was a great helpful. illustration, yeah. so it was much appreciated. So That's right. Last minute Thanks, random sir. thought. I'm glad it, glad it paid off. Uh, next on our agenda is Planning Commission considerations. I don't think we have any tonight, so we're on to Planning Director's report. Mr. Holt. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. Um, so the materials we've included in the Planning Director's report are included in your agenda packets. Just in the interest of time, I won't go through any more of those, but I would be remiss if I didn't dwell for a moment. I think we had a short write-up in there about the 3D printed home. Um, just what a cool opportunity that has been to witness, and, and I'm not taking any credit here. I've been on, uh, very much on, on the, the outside of that, looking in and watching all of those great partnerships develop and, and foster, and just what a, a very proud moment for me professionally. I hope it, it ends up being a very proud moment for the county um, that James City County could be a part of that historical moment. Uh, first 3D printed house for all of Habitat yeah. Humanity cool. anywhere. Um, the, uh, you know, at some point um, the, the builder had, had discussed how at least in his, as far as his understanding, it was the first occupied 3D printed home anywhere in the world. Um, but it's been a cool project. As you may have noticed, it started to gather a lot of attention uh, from the media at a national level even. And so, you know, if some of those hopes and aspirations about what that technology can do for affordable and workforce housing materialize and as this technology, as with any technology, really starts to, to gain hold and gain traction and, and become more of a, of a common construction technique than, than a demonstration project, we can say we're right there from the beginning. So it's, it's a very cool proud moment i think for staff and hopefully for for the larger county as a whole so um, with that i'd be happy to take any questions or answer anything else i could have any questions so thank we you go mr. Through the house 
What's that? Can we go see it? Like, I, I imagine the people that are living there are going to have to there now. Oh, suffer yeah, I think from they're people. living there now, but you can certainly drive by and look at it from the outside. Even from that perspective, it's kind of cool to see because I, I can tell you, just driving by, you wouldn't know. Huh. You know, you could find that home in any neighborhood in the county. I guess they never built, or they never did a uh, time lapse video or anything that. I think so. I don't know if it's it's been all the way put together. I'm thinking there is one out there. If so, that'd be an interesting one to add to the website to the county website. Yes, we have a very cool time. Sorry, I'm getting distracted. We have a very cool time lapse when they put all the turf down at Warhill. That's kind of cool to watch. <laughs> that was done within the last two years. Sorry, I'm not easily fascinated by all this stuff. But I think there is one. If I come across it, I'll I'll send you all. The link for sure. Good, thank you. Yeah. Oh, what's the address? Do you know the address? Um, I don't know the street address. I'll email it to you, but it's within the Forest Heights neighborhood, so Forest. sort of in between Lightfoot and the premium outlets. Oh, okay. I know that. Yeah, just kind of the down area. there on the right. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. And from up that way. A, well, there's a bunch of habitat houses back there. There are. That's been a really great, you know, it wasn't but like a decade ago when those were dirt streets and overhead utilities and no I've storm been back water. In there. It was, we approved something about a year and a half ago back there. That's correct. Um, so, uh, in addition to uh, that development, and that's going through site plan review now. That's probably wrapping up soon. I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's under construction here within, uh, within the year, maybe, but um, it's in that same neighborhood. And just what a great success story my opinion well, thank you mr holt appreciate thank you. it planning commission discussion and requests uh julia do, do you want to talk about your goochland planning commissioner oh yes I, I i don't know if i shared the response that i got from from mr kinsman about that but i had opportunity to meet a uh, member of the goochland county planning commission over the holidays and was talking about our concerns with the lack of a sunset clause on short-term rentals, Airbnbs and things. And he looked at me in surprise and said, oh, we do it all the time. You know, we routinely, we have a conditional SUP that we say it's good for five years, then we'll revisit it, sort of like the way we do with AFDs, and then renew it if it seems appropriate. So it doesn't automatically just convey with the property. Um, so I came back and I wrote Mr. Holt and Mr. Kinsman, and Mr. Kinsman wrote back and said that there's about a 50-50 split by county attorneys on the interpretation of the county's, um, of, of a county's ability to Im impose sunset laws, and that the county recently had, or there had been a mo movement to get it clarified at the state legislative level but there was such vehement opposition to that, that it was withdrawn. But that's still something that they're trying to get clarification for to allow counties. But some counties interpret it differently than we do. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Plus the legislative agenda that we submitted has the request in there to put a sunset clause on the Airbnb. And so I thought this was kind of a neat thing. Uh, and would solve a lot of our problems with what we have with all of these. But, but anyhow, I thought that was worthwhile. And Julia, thank you. Yes. So, Mr. Halaven, will you will you offer us an opinion contrary to Mr. Kinsman's? <laughs> Are you the other half? <laughs> wow, there's on the spot for you. <laughs> not, not at this time. <laughs> <laughs> it's <laughs> Dr. Rose? I'm sorry? Dr. Rose? I have uh, two reflections. I apologize for keeping people a little bit later, but two reflections on the Hazelwood discussion um, because they keep, I think they keep coming up not only with this but with other considerations. One is an aside. I, I find it unfortunate that Virginia Department of Transportation seems committed to keeping speed limits as high as possible irregardless of safety issues. And it baffles me how some of the roads around here are 55 miles per hour the, the one outside Bruton High School. That's a, a high school road. It's 55 miles per hour, and it's just baffling some of the speed limits around here. They just lowered the one on 30 up by, by uh, Stonehouse. Sue, Sue Sadler got 40. that through. 
Yeah. But, but even so, they're still bringing it. That's why. It sounds the, like it's a fight to to do anything that. I know. They have to fight. In regards to the lowering the speed limit. people, not necessarily the VDOT piece, and that's why the stoplights and then the limitation to 23 or 25 made sense for me, just because then there's just something that does it. But anyhow, you had a so, second for reflection. So this the second one is more a, about this issue of development that. And I, I'm very sympathetic to the landowner who has a lot of value built in that land if they can develop it. That, and I don't think this is anything that we could change or do. It's just something that I reflect on that it seems like there should be more value in the land and opportunities to value that land that go beyond building a factory or, or building and, and more building and houses. And it's unfortunate that we can't recognize that value. It, it, if we're com we well, if we're grow committed, something that brings in lots of money. But if we're committed to <laughs> maintaining the conservation and natural aspects of James City County, we have to be able to find value in that to support landowners who have big pieces of land that could stay forested and could contribute to the natural beauty of James City County. But there's no mechanism. I mean, there's land trust, there's opportunities for easements, but that's that those are limited and that's more of a, a tax issue and it's frustrating to me that the decision here is either let them develop it and sell off the land and, and cut down the woods or, or force them to keep it the way it is and, and lose any potential value that they may have and it's funny you mentioned that because when rick uh, sent out the uh, rural residential study that he had um, and you go and you look at the um, uh, stakeholders comments in there and these are people that actually live out in this area I mean th there's no if ands or buts about it but you start looking at the numbers and the numbers uh, are that almost 95 percent of the county's wooded area or in those in the rural area okay and there a lot of them are in smaller lots of under 20 acres as opposed to larger that make up the majority of it. So my comment back to Rich was, is this is exactly why I thought we should do something with carbon sequestration. So guess how much money the state rec uh, in revenue got from the RGGI this year? $211 million, okay? So that value of that goes back to the landowner if you had something like that. So I, I agree with you. If you can't get economic development, which that report is, you need to look at different ways to have that value. And, and so the, the uh, task force that Tammy Rosario is looking at to do the protect and preserve is at least taking the first step at looking at other value propositions besides the PDR, besides the AFD, or besides the zoning for the reduction of housing pieces. So uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing what they come up with to get to the idea that by giving value to it, you protect the environment, do all those sorts of things that you're talking about, Rob. Right, because you have to give the Hazelwoods an option. They don't have an option right now necessarily as far as they see it. Well, they don't, but, they're, but remember, there's never going to be a silver bullet for everybody in the county, and that's why you need multiple tools, which is exactly what Paul's been talking about with a lot of the things. He needs a toolkit to be able to do some different things for different people. So uh, I agree with you. We just got to put different tools in the well, box. They could, they could still, without the rezoning, they could build houses. They could I, do anything they wanted. No, I understand. But that. it would look I, horrible. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. That, that's what I was trying to yeah, balance. I don't, yeah, the value how piece do you make to your to land more valuable? I don't know. And there's, there are creative solutions out there, whether it be apprentice pro, apprenticeship programs on, on a piece of land for, for, the, for people who want to learn farming, but they're, you're young enough that they can't afford to buy a farm themselves. So, the, so you can do an apprenticeship with them. There's the, the um, community, um, or, or there's the food hub, there's community kitchens, there's the idea of having viticulture and, and food well, the storage. the ecotourism piece. Ecotourism. I mean, there really is a lot, but it takes... Uh, it, it takes a willingness, I think, on the part of the county to start advocating for this and whether that it be public-private, private-private, whatever. There's a lot of models out there, but to, to Rob's point, and I think he, he put it very well, is it shouldn't just be for a landowner a case of either develop the property or 
go broke or whatever, um, you know, there's 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 got to be a, a a better a better solution to the solar generate farms that. is another alternative to folks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd love to see a solar farm there. Right? I mean, like, so we, anyhow, that's what Paul's going to come tell us about here in another year. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Rob, to your point, you know, when we were talking earlier, it wasn't nearly as as eloquent as others, but what I what I the point I was trying to make was if you know if there's three million square feet developed at that interchange, there are not going to be demand. There's not going to be demand for another three million square feet at Anderson's Corner. So uh, you know I would much rather see it concentrated in one locality close to 64 as opposed to bringing that traffic just a mile and a half further down the road and you know when we have we have a historical site at anderson's corner we have lots of i mean it's the exact same parcel you know it's the exact same setup it's it's acreage with farmland and trees and you know uh, hopefully if this piece is developed in that fashion then it'll take some of that pressure off of off of the other property but aren't, aren't, in that scenario aren't we assuming that two different landowners are sort of collectively thinking about that space and and to me it i agree with what you're saying that there you could build this and maybe there's not a need for it but it doesn't mean there's not going to be another landowner who says i have this land and there's value in it if i could find somebody to buy it and develop it oh i fully i fully expect it you know the 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 folks who own Anderson's Corner were here at the last public hearing and spoke out in support of it. So, you know, I, I fully expect that that the Taylor family will be coming next. So, again, if, you know, I, and Which I'm Which is not, why the language that we approved again for that property was so important, because it talks about rural um, industries. It doesn't talk about any of those other things. For and, and that was why some of us were very hard over to that that language stayed that way so that there was an alternative to what we were talking about. Good discussion. I mean, I, I still chuckle when, you know, when the, what is now John Deere, you know, James River Equipment came up for a special use permit some years ago and we had a planning commissioner who said that wasn't in keeping, you know, that John Deere was not in keeping with the rural landscape of James <laughs> City County. So, um, you know, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Let's leave it at that. So, any any other discussions or requests? Sorry, I have the board coverage next week. Yes, you do. Looking, looking forward to it, say? I can tell board you. Board coverage. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. It's going to be another lengthy meeting, but that's... Is it so when will Hazelwood come up with the board? Not tentatively, the first meeting in February, but, you know, tentative, because tentatively, the first meeting in February. February, February. Tentatively, because okay. you remember, okay. they, they set their own okay. agenda, so... And I would just, obviously, we'll ask Julia to come back in February, but, um, you know, her term goes off at the end of the month, so I'd be remiss in not just saying thank you for participating in in your last meeting tonight i understand she's not going to re-up so um the board will be considering obviously we have julia's which is an at-large position and the berkeley spot still open so hopefully we'll we'll be back up to full speed in short order so julia thank you very much we appreciate all your efforts and um you know especially in in keeping us straight with our language <laughs> thank you julia thank you, thank you julia thank you julia yep so I'll, that, see you I'll see you next I'll month. I'll see you next month. Okay. With language. <laughs> so with that, I'll entertain the motion to adjourn. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Aye.